No Time Like the Future. Written by Michael Moreau. Read by Chantal Pitt. Chapter 1 Captain Tarsic was one of the most intimidating men to ever set boot on a rocket ship. Like all fashionable men of the 27th century, he wore a cape, but unlike the rest of them, his was tattered from years of fighting off pirates and grappling with local thugs when deals went bad. He wore it like a badge of honour, just as he did the scars that adorned his face and formidable body. The cape's yellow fabric hung loosely against his service-issued polysynthetic uniform that glistened with an iridescence that changed its colour from blue to purple depending on the angle it was viewed from. The service was a loose organisation that banded together merchantmen and mercenaries. It had become a powerful entity in galactic trade and was comprised of nearly a 100,000 ships and crews from all across known space. With the advent of the Nielsen Cabarro Drive in the late 2270s, humanity had spread out to hundreds of colony worlds, scattered all across the galaxy, and whatever one world lacked, another often had in spades. This is where the service came in. The men of the service adhered to a rank structure, but only a loose one. In practice, the captain, and often owner, of each ship was in charge of his own destiny. Assignments were passed down via telewave, but most captains bartered with one another to trade assignments or postpone mundane ones for more lucrative ones. The entire system was rather complex, but Captain Tarsic was a master of it. That's not to say that he was fond of it, however. He often ruffled quite a few feathers by doing whatever he damn well pleased, and it earned him more than a handful of enemies. He'd made even more friends, though with his courageous, sometimes downright brazen actions. Many a ship captain in the service owed their lives to Captain Tarsic of the infamous rocket ship Honshu. When queried by crewmen, he'd always said that the name came from some distant memory of Earth, an island where, supposedly, his ancient ancestors had lived. He often talked, over plenty of whiskey of course, about how his great-great-great Great, 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 the number often varied. Grandfather had been admired as a sumo warrior, for his great physical strength. The truth was, of course, that most folks in known space knew virtually nothing of their heritage, and that if they said they did, they were lying. The early days of colonisation were hectic, and so much got lost in the scuffle. Hell, even well into modern times, Things were still a mess. It was so hard to keep track of the comings and goings of over a trillion human beings that had scattered throughout the stars, many on alien worlds. Most folks assumed that the entirety of human history was out there somewhere, but that it was just so scattered that getting a clear picture of it was fairly difficult. Only in recent years had scholars began to come together via the telenet to even start the process of piecing it all back together. It was very likely that their task would not be complete for many generations to come, long after Captain Tarsic and the crew of Honshu was long dead and their bodies were drifting among the stars. Their most recent trek had brought them to the backwards alien world of Casella to trade for precious minerals, a venture that was sure to bring an easy return for the captain and his crew. The ship's first mate was Ansel, a Martian. He stood upright like a man, and for most intents and purposes, looked pretty similar. But he was covered in a thin layer of white fur, was stockily built, and had pupils considerably larger than those of a human. Having long ago gone underground to escape the changing conditions of their homeworld, Martians had adapted well to subsurface living. So on planets like Casella, he often wore dark welding goggles to shield his sensitive eyes from the brightness. Today he wore them beneath his helmet, or bubble, as the men liked to call it, since it was little more than a transparent polymer sphere that covered the user's head and supported a breathable atmosphere. Both Ansel and Captain Tarsic wore them as they descended the honcho's loading ramp and stepped onto the crunchy alien soil, 
to oversee the final loading of the ship. Both of their capes flapped in the thin winds of Casella, that was composed of more methane than either of them would have been able to tolerate had they taken their bubbles off. Ansel was the only other man on the ship the captain allowed to wear a cape, and that was because he owed his life to the sarcastic little Martian many times over. Even then, Ansel only wore his when he felt like being a bit pretentious. Most of the time, he could be found wearing a simple mechanics uniform, and a vest with an array of pockets filled with a wide assortment of tools. The captain tapped a button on his belt and spoke into the telewave. Is that the last of them? One of the men pushing the heavily laden Negagrav sledge spoke back to him in between heavy breaths. No, sir. One more sledge behind us. His sentence was nearly cut off, as other crewmen, out of line of sight, began activating their telewave units frantically and screaming for help. Everyone stopped what they were doing and turned to the hill that hid the nearby native village from sight. The last sledge crested the hill, and the captain instantly saw why they were panicking. A barrage of arrows was pelting the sledge and its contents, as well as the two men who were pushing it. They changed their mind, sir! One of the desperate men yelled into his telewave. You, get your asses in gear and get that sledge on the ship double time. Tarsic yelled at the first team of men, who had stopped to see what the commotion was all about. The natives, who called themselves Kashyyyk, were about five feet tall and very lanky. They walked about on four legs and had two arms that were long and quite strong. This made them excellent bowmen. Luckily for the crewmen of the Honshu, Standard Issue Service uniforms were made of a material that was designed to stop penetrating blows from sharp objects like arrows and knives, at least most of the time. It still hurt like hell, though, and the captain knew that at any moment the Kashyyyk tribesmen would be upon them, and all it would take is a club to the helmet to be all she wrote. Tarsic and Ansel leapt into action and ran like mad for the top of the hill. What happened? He screamed into his telewave as he approached the sledge. I guess they realised that ostrich feathers weren't really worth over a ton of sapphires and emeralds, sir, Crewman Jones responded, all the while ducking arrow fire. As they crested the hill, the captain gestured to Ansel to help the men push the sledge, and he reached for the spiral ray pistol that was always at his side. In one oh-so-familiar move, he dropped to his knee, unholstered the weapon, and trained his aim on the nearest Kashyyyk tribesman, who was, by now, only about ten metres away. A calm squeeze of the trigger, and the outdated, yet still very deadly, gun shot forth a spiralling helix of proton energy that vaporised his target. At the sight of such a display, the rest of the locals ceased their approach, and simply stood there, with their bows drawn and pointed at Captain Tarsic's body. How are we doing back there? Loading the last sledge now, sir. Excellent. Ansel, cover me. The captain turned and bolted for the ship, only to be greeted by the impact of what were probably two dozen arrows against his back. He knew it was going to happen, but that didn't make it hurt any less. As he ran down the hill, he saw his first officer standing on the loading ramp, blaster in hand. Ansel unleashed a few bolts of green proton energy at targets cresting the hill. The captain couldn't tell if he was actually hitting anything, or if they were just warning shots. The Martian preferred not to kill when possible, so the latter was more likely. Tarsic's sheer bulk made the sound of his boots hitting the loading ramp ring out, clearly distinguishable, even over the sound of Ansel's blaster fire. Fast, we lift in three he yelled into his telewave. He was addressing Emily Faust, the ship's pilot, and also the only woman serving on board. Copy, sir. Crewman Jones had already jumped into action, and had smashed the button against the bulkhead that began the process of raising the ramp and filling the loading bay with Earth-typical atmosphere. Tarsic began walking up the quickly ascending ramp, but suddenly winced and clutched at his back. A single arrow 
out of the barrage that he'd sustained, had managed to puncture his service uniform and was now lodged a few inches from his spine, near the middle of his back. His first officer put out a supportive hand, but the captain turned it away. The natives were still over 20 metres away from the ship when the hatch finished sealing, but even through a 120 centimetre thick armour plating, the sound of wooden arrows harmlessly plinking off the hull could be heard, if only just. The sound was quickly overwhelmed by a rush of fresh air into the two levels that made up the Honshu's loading bay. You'd better get up to dock and have him take a look at that, Ansel told his boss as he removed his helmet. The captain only gave his exo the slightest of nods, as an acknowledgement that he'd heard him, before he removed his own bubble and sat down on the sledge. He gave his crewmen a slight smile that said, Job well done, then reached back and snapped off the arrow. The drone of the Honshu's engines slowly turned into a roar as she prepared to lift, and the tribesmen, who had been pelting her with projectiles, quickly turned and ran. By the time her neutron rockets achieved full power and scorched the ground, they were safely back in their village. Above thatched huts, they watched as the alien rocket ship soared into the sky and slowly disappeared into the haze of Casella's upper atmosphere. Chapter 2 The RS Honshu was of the old interplanetary corporation's Type 7 design, about as robust as they came, but nearing a century old. Captain Tarsic had saved her from the scrapyard for the low, low price of 2,000 credits that he'd won playing cards in a seedy bar on Octurus 4. He'd spent the next four years working his fingers to the bone to raise the nearly 10,000 credits it took to get her spaceworthy again. That wasn't the legend that he told most of his crew about how he and the Honshu came together, but close confidants like Ansel knew the truth. To everyone else, she was a former pirate ship, one that Tarsic had been kidnapped and forced to serve on before turning the tables on his captors and seizing the ship for himself. It made for great narrative in the mess hall on drunken evenings, especially when someone new joined the crew. The Honshu carried a crew of 37 souls, most of which rotated out on a regular basis, but about half a dozen stayed on as regular crew. They, of course, benefited from a larger share of the ship's take whenever it came time for the captain to divvy up the credits. No one knew what kind of fortune the ship's commander had managed to accumulate over the course of his career, as he was very secretive about his finances, but he certainly did put a lot of it into the ship itself. Despite being nearly a century old, the Honshu was outfitted with pretty much all of the latest technology. In fact, its loadout was often much better than other ships in the service, as the vast majority of them were at least a decade or so old. But the old Type 7 kept getting upgrade after upgrade to keep her in tip-top shape. Captain Tarsic liked to brag at length to other captains that his old girl was as sturdy as they used to make them, but as advanced as they make them now. Her titanium space frame was much more solidly built than newer ships, because the old neutron rockets would shake a ship apart if she wasn't heavy enough. With new engines and tons of upgrades which had made her lighter than stock, she truly was a unique vessel. Not being one to take chances, and always one to see the opportunity afforded by every situation, the captain had, years back, salvaged a Mark IX proton cannon off of a derelict colonial warship. The piece of technology had laid in deep space, undisturbed for close to two centuries. Since the colonial wars that had ended Earth's dominance over human worlds, nothing with that kind of firepower had been manufactured since, and it was an incredible find. Still, Ansel and most of the crew had called him mad when he'd suggested fitting it to the Honshu. Their fears were justified. On every occasion that it had been fired, it had caused massive damage to the ship's own power systems. During one daring pirate raid, however, it had been the only thing that had prevented their capture and likely servitude or ransom. Their little Mark IX cannons had overheated, and a torpedo had malfunctioned in the tube. With surrender not being an option, Captain Tarsic had opted to go for broke and use the big old Mark IX. It had blasted the pirate rocket into two halves and left her drifting in space. Ansel had wanted to take prisoners and collect bounties, but the captain decided against it, 
They were running a skeleton crew, and he didn't want to be dealing with prisoners who could overwhelm them and take the ship. No, instead he opted to leave them floating there. It was near a very well-travelled trade lane, so he knew the survivors would be found before long. Secretly, he'd hoped they'd be found by another pirate ship, one that would press their crew into service aboard their ship, give them a taste of their own medicine. The captain and his men had been born into a universe that was ruled loosely by a political organisation known as the Federated Worlds. Each member world, human and alien alike, was considered a sovereign entity, but they operated under the banner of the FW in order to benefit from the trade agreements, as well as the peace and stability afforded by such an organisation. Every world in known space flew the FW flag. There was just so much to be gained by being a part of the Alliance and nothing to be had by shunning it. Easily enough to believe, if one knows humans. Only mankind has ever brought wide-scale warfare to the stars. Aliens had fought for millennia before mankind joined them out in the deep, but only mankind brought the gift of true militarization. Earth's influence exploded in early years, only to be resented later on by the colonies who began to declare their independence in rapid-fire succession. Earth's establishment, not being one to give up easily on old ways, declared war on the colonies and built massive fleets to re-establish control. The colonies, of course, built their own fleets, and thus began the colonial wars. They lasted for over two decades, and culminated in the invasion of the solar system by colonial forces, and an orbital bombardment that ended in Earth's surrender. In those final days, once the tide had clearly turned, even the colonies closer to home like Mars and Europa, sided with the Colonials. When the fighting stopped, and the ashes had settled, Earth was not enslaved, but rather left to her own devices with a caveat that she should never attempt to control the other worlds again. The Federated Worlds was born, and the large fleets were slowly dismantled as they became too expensive to maintain and served no purpose. Enter the time of the service. Someone had to maintain order, so it fell to privateers. Ships of the service acted as mercenaries to fight small-scale engagements over disputes, traders to ferry expensive goods that required protection, as escorts to large shipping convoys, and, of course, as bounty hunters to track down infamous pirates. Sure, local police ships kept order maintained pretty well in system, but once you were into deep space, there was very little standing between your cargo and a pirate's proton cannon. Despite Captain Tarsic's bravado, He seldom took bounty hunting assignments, or even combat operations. He preferred a mental challenge. And that usually meant the Honshu was off to some remote world to trade for precious goods with some backwards locals who were potentially dangerous, as had ended up being the case on Casella. Those were often the most lucrative of deals, but it took a special type of captain to negotiate them, and most servicemen were not up to the task. While quite physically imposing, Captain Tarsic's most impressive features were his mental faculties. He was very decisive and had an almost unnatural talent for reading someone else. This made him especially suited to dealing with natives that most would have no hope of ever forming any kind of bond with. Unitrans could only go so far. It could make spoken words understandable, but on most occasions there was much more to it than just the language. One had to watch for every little clue about a culture, Sometimes the slightest slip-up in body movement or facial expression could lead to disaster. With his incredibly stoic exterior, the captain was great at observing and not reacting, at least when he wanted to. This was a gift that had brought the men of the Honshu much wealth and quite a reputation among the service. Chapter 3 Aeolus Station was one of the newest facilities in known space. It sat at the middle of what old spacefarers had nicknamed the Crux, a region of space where NC drives simply wouldn't function. The facility had been built to serve as a sector-wide secure deposit, for valuable materials being brought in by service ships, and deposited into the accounts of their wealthy client corporations. Any ship approaching Aeolus had to drop to sublight and spend a full day at maximum burn to reach it. This meant that surprise attacks by groups of pirate vessels were virtually impossible. This also meant that the Honshu was going to be a couple of days behind schedule, and now would be forfeiting a valuable convoy escort contract leaving from Nixiris Prime. 
If there was one thing that truly ruffled Captain Tarsic's feathers, it was when a client changed his orders in the middle of fulfilling a contract. Sure, he was well within his legal rights to tell them to jet off, but that might mean pissing off one of their higher-ups and never getting work from their firm again. Not something that a man in his position was capable of doing, if he planned on staying in the business very long. So, it was on to this newfangled high-security facility in the middle of the crux, and back to scanning the telenet trades in search of a new contract. The captain had already endured the chiding of Dr. Ramos, which was probably more painful than having the sometimes shaky-handed older gentleman actually remove the arrow. He was now ready to turn in for the night. Job hunting could wait until the morning. He passed the mess hall and heard Jones and several of the other auxiliary crewmen playing a rather rowdy game of cards. Had the day gone differently, and it wasn't strictly against Doctor's orders, he'd likely have joined them, more to drink than to gamble. Being the better part of £300, the burly space dog was known to be able to put down more than his fair share. Paying far too much attention to the fun going on in the mess hall, Captain Tarsic found himself crashing into Ansel, who had come around the corner quickly, and apparently had other thoughts on his mind as well. Being nearly a foot shorter than his superior, Ansel only bounced off the captain's rather large torso. Sorry, Captain, he said, looking up and rubbing his forehead. Don't apologise, Ansel. I should have been watching where I was going, instead of contemplating breaking physician's orders and going for a drink. The Martian cracked a wry smile. He had quite a talent for drinking as well, and had even been known to drink the much larger Captain Tarsic under the table, on a couple of occasions. Something about Martian metabolism, at least that's what the captain assured himself. Where are you headed in such a hurry? The captain asked. It was a dumb question, and he knew it. If Ansel was headed aft, it was either to the engines or to the drive room. We'd just dropped out of NC space, and I was going to secure the drive before I got some rack time. Tarsic nodded and patted his old friend on the shoulder, before moving aside to let him pass. The Martian walked away, in the peculiar semi-shuffle fashion that Martians call walking. Shortly down the hall, and without turning back, he added, Do not play cards, Harry. Go to bed. The captain couldn't help but smile to himself. Ansel was the only person on board that ever called him by his first name. Technically, it was Harridor, but Harry was easier and sounded quite old-timey. Emily Faust would also address him in the familiar on occasion, but with her it was always Tarsic, not Harry. In private, he'd taken to calling her Emily over the years, but in front of other crew, it was always Pilot Faust, or just Faust in a pinch. Securing the NC drive was absolutely vital. If a ship flew into the crux while travelling in NC space, it would simply drop back to normal space. But if the drive accidentally engaged while inside the spatial anomaly, the results were disastrous. At least that's what everyone assumed. One ship had done it ages ago, as an experiment by its foolish captain. And it vanished without a trace. No debris, no wreckage, it just vanished. The best explanation anyone could come up with was that attempting to engage the drive inside of the crux had flung the ship off in some random direction, at so many multiples of sea that it might have ended up in the vast emptiness that existed between galaxies. Not the void between the Milky Way and the Magellanic Clouds. Those were long treks, surely, but far from impossible. In fact, the Honshu herself had made the journey on several occasions. No, if the theory held correct, the poor ship and all the souls aboard her had probably ended up millions of light years away from anything, left to die without enough food, fuel, or oxygen to ever reach help. The safety procedure for physically locking down the NC drive before entering the crux had been beamed to the Honshu, along with the orders that had instructed her to deliver her cargo to Aeolus Station, instead of Taraxia 3, like the contract had originally stipulated. Captain Tarsic had complete confidence in Ansel, who served not only as the ship's second-in-command, but also as her chief mechanic. Knowing that everything was in good hands, he headed for his bunk to catch a few winks. Back in normal space, and zipping along at full burn, the rocket would rendezvous with the station in just over 24 standard solar hours. 
That would give her crew the rest they'd all gotten too little of lately. Colonies and corporations had been expanding into Canis Major, a dwarf galaxy whose stars were slowly spiralling in as the Milky Way gobbled it up whole. Any large expansion generally meant big business for ships in the service. Survey of the dying dwarf galaxy had started before the turn of the century, but the go-ahead for settlements and business ventures had only been given by the Federated Worlds two years ago. Servicemen had seen this all before. It had happened 80 years prior, with the large and small Magellanic clouds. There would be a huge rush at first, that would slow to a trickle of interest after 10 years or so. In those eight decades, less than one quarter of one percent of the large and small clouds had been settled and industrialised. Fools and wanderers. That was the typical opinion of those who left the Milky Way behind. A few corporations and individuals did manage to strike it rich in the new territories, but more often than not, they ended up living out their days on some backwater planet that nobody had ever even heard of. Still, the crew of the Honshu certainly didn't mind the business, especially since most of them had grown up with the stories of how rich their fathers and grandfathers had gotten off the last galactic boom. 24 hours would be plenty for Jones and the other auxiliary men to sleep off whatever kind of drunken stupor they managed to work up. It also would be time for the captain to nurse his wound. Ansel would no doubt spend his time reviewing technical manuals from the ship's data tapes, or tinkering with some piece of equipment that he felt was in need of a tune-up. Faust, being a diligent pilot, would stay by her post with little to no sleep, despite the fact that the ship was flying on automatic and in a straight line through relatively empty space. The Doctor was quite interested in culture, of which there was no lack in known space. There was so much, in fact, that the average person threw up their hands in exasperation at the sheer thought of trying to experience it all. But not Dr. Ramos. One would think that with his advancing years, and subsequently less time left, he'd find more constructive things to do with his time. But instead, he spent countless hours sifting through documents on the history and cultural traditions of various worlds, listening to their music, watching their films. It made most others' heads spin. With no distractions aboard a corporate space station, like seedy saloons or bizarre alien brothels, they'd simply unload, fill out some paperwork, and quickly be underway again. Then another 24 hours for drunken card games, alien stage plays and what have you, and they'd be back in the normal universe. If the universe could ever be called that. Life would continue as normal, and the crew of the Honshu would work their tails off, some of them literally, until the rocket would put in for yearly inspection, and one week of leave. That was six months away, however, and the captain had no intentions of letting up on his men for an instant until that day arrived. They knew him to be a very fair man, but one who held the highest of expectations for everyone who served aboard his ship. Chapter 4 Slowly but steadily, the white speck that was Aeolus Station grew in the cockpit windows of the Honshu. Tartik had been right in his assumption. Despite absolutely no need for her to be at her post, Emily Faust had sat in that pilot seat nearly the entire 24 hours they travelled through the crux. She'd napped a bit in one of the chairs at the back of the cockpit, while letting junior pilot Sam Herschel get in a few minutes of seat time. As the station grew larger and larger, through the transparent titanium panes, another shape began to emerge. Um, the captain asked, his mouth full of ham sandwich. Faust? What the hell is that? Right on it, captain. The fair-haired girl in her mid-twenties announced, as she began wrapping keys on her chair with her right hand. Emily had been the ship's pilot, since the age of 18. She was the best pilot that Captain Tarsic had ever seen. She was about average height and of an athletic build. Her pretty blue eyes and pale complected face was framed by little dirty blonde curls that had escaped her attempt at a ponytail. Being the only female on board, and a fairly attractive one at that, meant that she was usually the first thing new crewmen noticed but the permanent crew were very protective of her. They acted like big brothers, 
and quickly made it known that Faust was off limits for pursuit. Pulling her IFF, sir, she paused, while the data spewed out onto a nearby screen. IPHS Prometheus. Commission date of February 7, 2674. Holy shit! She's brand new! She's fragging huge! Junior pilot Herschel piped up. There's no mistaking that. Specs? The captain asked. Looks like... 450 metres, and weighing in at over 2 million tonnes, sir. The surprise was apparent in the young pilot's voice. That put her over twice the length and mass of the Honshu, despite obviously being designed to fulfil the same role. A multi-purpose interstellar rocket. The captain fixed his eyes on the beast as he finished the last bite of his lunch. What kind of armament on that thing? Emily turned her head to look at the captain, who was standing over her left shoulder and behind her chair situated at the centre of the cockpit. You sure? She was asking if the captain really wanted her to scan the Prometheus. The IFF had cross-referenced information from the Telenet to get the ship's basic specifications, but weaponry was not part of that publicly available data, for obvious reasons. Directly scanning the ship could be perceived as rude at best, or hostile at worst. Do it. Tarsic didn't care if the IPH jerks were offended. Anything that could even remotely represent a threat to his ship, he felt he was justified in gathering intelligence on. Looks like... Wow. Six proton cannons, all Mark IV. Three torpedo tubes, 15 point defence laser turrets, and 183 centimetre armour. She's certainly ready for a fight. The red light that indicated an incoming telewave, lit up on the auxiliary control panel that junior pilot Herschel was sitting at. The captain took quick note of it. Vidwave communication coming in from the station, Captain. Shall I patch it through? Captain Tarsic nodded, then turned to face the imaging screen that was located on the bulkhead, just above the cockpit's front window. They hadn't received any vidwaves in over a month, so static crackled as the screen came to life. Herschel fiddled with some controls to bring the picture into tune. Essa von Braun. You know, Captain, that if you'd wanted to see my new toy, you could have simply asked, don't you? It was true that Harrod or Tarsic had more friends than enemies, but Essa von Braun solidly fell into the latter category. Some years back, some of the crew of her ageing Aris Japard, a dilapidated old hunk that could barely lift orbit, and whose name ironically meant Cheetah, had tried to poach one of his contracts by going behind his back and trying to outbid him on some native precious metals. She claimed to have known nothing about it, but he discovered evidence to the contrary. When he had confronted her with it, instead of backing down gracefully, she'd had him and Ansel roughed up in a dark alleyway. Tarsic had lifted off and hidden the honshu behind a moon, then pounced whenever the Japard tried to depart. After nearly pummeling that old hunk into a cloud of rusty particles, they'd withdrawn and called the authorities, and provided them with all of the information regarding von Braun and her crew's misdeeds. Last he'd heard, her service commission had been revoked, and she'd had to retire that old rust bucket of hers. I can tell by the look on your face that you are extremely surprised to see me, Captain. That would be an understatement now, wouldn't it? He muttered through a forced smile. The woman's disposition seemed cordial enough, and neither Faust nor Herschel had been on board when the previous run-in had occurred, so both were oblivious to the tension they were now smack dab in the middle of. We were notified to expect you, Captain, so we've prepared Docking Platform 7 for your arrival. Please instruct your pilot to reduce velocity and switch to manoeuvring thrusters only once within 20 kilometres of the station. Just then, the hatch opened, and Ansel walked in. Upon seeing the face of Essa von Braun on the screen, he dropped one of the cups of coffee he'd been carrying 
no doubt the one he'd been nice enough to prepare for the captain. The captain gave him a pair of eyes that said, Yes, that is who you think it is, but keep your trap shut. Hello, Ansel, came the voice from the screen. It's been a very long time, hasn't it? Oh, yes, ma'am, he replied, managing to hold back most of his displeasure with a snarky smile. Well, I look forward to seeing my old rival and my favourite Martian once you're aboard the station. Please do come aboard personally, Captain. We obviously have so much to catch up on. Oh, absolutely. I wouldn't miss this for the world, the Captain stated, with all of the forced cordiality he could muster. With that, the vidway faded out, and the screen shut itself off automatically. How in the blazing suns did Essa von Braun end up commander of an interplanetary holding station? Ansel asked the obvious. An even better question is, what nasty surprise does she have waiting for us on that station? Tarsic pointed out, as he turned back to his old friend. I knew before she said it, but if we've been invited on board personally, she's got something up her sleeve that doesn't bode well for us. I don't understand. Faust looked at her commander with genuine curiosity. The captain stood and motioned for Herschel to go grab a mop to clean up Ansel's mess. He put his arm on the back of Faust's chair and spoke. To say that Essa von Braun and I have a history is to put it lightly. The young pilot wrinkled her brow and thought, You don't mean... Taken aback by the very thought, Tarsic snapped. Absolutely not. Who wouldn't lay hands on that hag if she was the last female creature in the cosmos? Faust giggled. She loved getting a rise out of the captain. He let her get away with it too, because she was such a damned good pilot and such an endearing person. Sorry, I didn't mean to insinuate. It's okay. No, my... He turned to Ansel. Our business with Von Braun was nothing in the vicinity of pleasure. She let some of her crew poach one of our contracts and got violent when I confronted her about it. We blasted that rust bucket she called a ship back into the Stone Age and had her arrested. How she possibly could be in charge of a space station run by a security firm is completely beyond me. So what do we do? The first officer asked as he took a sip of his coffee, which was still just a bit too hot. There's trouble waiting on that station for us. You know it. Oh, absolutely. But I'm not going to be bullied by Essa von Braun. She might be in charge of that station, but we're a ship of the service, and the last time I checked, law and order still prevailed. Still, I have no plans on going unprepared. Captain... You might want to take a look at this, Faust piped up. What is it, Pilot Faust? Those docking platforms, sir. Open space. No atmosphere. That was strange. It had probably been more than a decade since any of them had seen a space station with open vacuum docking platforms. That would mean helmets just to be able to leave the ship. A security measure, perhaps? Open platforms where any raiders had to try to run in microgravity while wearing helmets would be much more defensible than a standard docking collar that gave easy access to the facility. Being stuck in the middle of the crux wasn't good enough. These IPH arseholes had gone to every precaution, it seemed. Well, bring her in and land on platform 7 like the lady said, Tarsic instructed Faust. Aye, aye, sir. He leaned in closer to Ansel and spoke, making sure that no one else could hear. You, I, and... He thought for a moment, struggling to remember one of the auxiliary crewmen's names. Jones will go. I'm going to keep Faust on standby, to lift at a moment's notice, and a contingent of armed men waiting in the loading bay, should we need any cover fire on our return. I don't expect it to come to that, but you know I like to be prepared. Ansel simply nodded, begrudgingly agreeing with his old friend and commanding officer. Chapter 
Chapter 5 So, let me get this straight, Jones complained, as he made sure all of the openings on his service uniform were properly secured. We're just going to walk right into what you're almost completely certain is a trap. Yep. Well, why'd you pick me to come along, sir? You were the first name that popped into my head. Why? You don't like a little adventure? With all due respect, sir, I wouldn't call this adventure. More like... Suicide. You said it for yourself. She's got a vendetta against you. Well, at least I'd assume she would. Regardless, this is a corporate space station. There's only so much they'll let her get away with. Likely we'll exchange some rather crass words, and she'll try to find some way of ruining my future prospects for IPH contracts. We'll be fine, crewman. Ansel had said nothing. He was busy checking his own uniform. When he was finished, he'd pulled a device from a nearby cabinet and scanned himself to check for suit defects, then proceeded to check the other two men. He'd put on his finest cape, a green shiny one that Faust had given him for his Lunark, the Martian equivalent of a birthday. Jones eyed him curiously when he picked up his dark goggles and strapped them to his forehead. Ansel, we're going for a walk in space. I doubt that it's going to be very bright, the junior crewman pointed out. Have you ever been on a corporate station? They're white. All of them. White! Why they have to be so bloody bright is completely beyond me. The captain merely chuckled at the exchange. Oh, and one more thing. The Martian walked over to Jones and grabbed him by the uniform. That's First Officer Ansel, and if you forget it again... I'll have you scrubbing pots for the rest of your tour. Got me? Jones suddenly snapped to attention. Yes, sir. Ansel wasn't the type to get bent out of shape over rank, but with the auxiliary crewmen, he understood that it was important for them to know their place. Captain? The voice was scratchy and came over the loading bay's intercom. It was Herschel. Go ahead, Mr. Herschel. We've received instructions from the station, sir, regarding loadout. Okay. Can you please tell me how they read? The station's platform is designed to provide artificial gravity and has a system that will provide a temporary atmosphere for you to make the crossing from the ship to the station. They've instructed specifically for you not to wear helmets of any kind. Any crewman attempting to approach the station with either a helmet or personal weaponry, will be shot on sight by the station's automated defences. Wow. They don't ask much, do they? Ansel chimed in. So they want us to walk out into space with no helmets and no weapons and trust them to keep us alive? Captain Tarsic asked. The intercom lay silent for a moment before Herschel responded. That's what it seems like, sir. Very well. Message received. Thank you, junior pilot Herschel. The intercom crackled as it deactivated. The captain turned to his men, who both had a none-too-approving look on their faces. This whole proposition had already seemed sketchy enough, but it was looking worse by the minute. Tarsic had already instructed Faust to record everything the Honshu sensors and communications channels were capable of recording. It might all be needed as evidence, at some later date, to use against Von Braun and IPH. As an extra layer of precaution, the captain himself had a hidden audio recording device that tucked neatly into his left ear. It recorded to internal storage, instead of a telewave back to the ship, 
which the station would easily detect and jam. He was gambling that the technology was old enough that it would go unnoticed. Likewise, Ansel had tucked an old plasma derringer, good for one shot, into his right boot that had been designed to fool scanners. When the men were ready, they had Faust signal the station, who in turn signalled her that the temporary gravity and atmosphere field was in place. They all instinctively held their breath and grabbed onto something solid as the loading bay door opened, but nothing of consequence happened. A moment later, they were off, pushing the first of the Negagrav sledges down the ramp. As they made their way out onto the platform, they were greeted by a near 360-degree panorama of the crux. The entire region of space was part of the much larger and heavily trafficked Firefly Nebula. The glowing gases, dimly lit by a star two light years distant, made for an incredible sight. Yellow and green swells as far as the eye could see. None of the men had ever stood directly inside a nebula before. Even Captain Tarsic, who had been around the galaxy several times over, had never quite experienced anything like it. His attention quickly turned, however, to the station itself. On a tower situated above the door that they were headed for shone a bright golden light, no doubt the device that projected the field that was keeping them alive. A gravity and atmosphere envelope that could disappear at the flip of a switch. A pretty good security system, he had to admit. There was also the blaster turret directly over the door, a visible sign that this place would tolerate no funny business. How do you like that view, Jones? The captain called out to the crewman, who was pulling the large cable that would allow the station to reel in the sledges. I've never seen the like, sir. And you probably won't again. Jones thought about that statement for a moment, and decided that it had not been meant as a commentary on their own potentially dangerous predicament, but instead on just how awesome and rare such a sight truly was. As all three of them reached the airlock, their telewaves crackled into life. This is Aeolus Command. Opening outer doors. The voice was not that of Essa von Braun. No, she had peons to do the menial tasks for her now. With a loud, clanking metal sound, the large door began to open. Inside was a chamber that was obviously an airlock, as it had a second set of metal doors just like the outside ones. The three men from the Honshu, dragging the cable, stepped inside, and the inner door also began to open. With the atmosphere force field in place, it was safe to open both sets of doors. As the inner door opened, A large hovering robo pushed its way into the airlock and stuck out a thick metal arm. Jones understood and placed the cable into its grasp. Without any sound of acknowledgement, the robot simply began to retreat back into the station, now with four laden sledges in tow. The men simply stood to the side, against the walls, as each sledge passed them in turn. Once the final one had entered the station, the airlock outer doors began to close. From the cockpit of the Honshu, Emily Faust saw the golden light on the platform's tower go dark. The environment-generating field had been powered down. Ansel slid his goggles into place as they stepped from the dim airlock out into the brightly lit station, painted all white, of course, just as he had predicted. Four men with impeccably clean uniforms of white and all trimmed in a light blue stood nearby, waiting to greet them. One of them clearly wore captain's stripes. The other three men were at attention, while this fellow stood much more relaxed and smiled as he extended a hand in greeting to Captain Tarsic. Captain? 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 Ah, yes, 
and my name is Deutron Cal, captain of the Prometheus. Commander von Braun informed me that you scanned her on your way in. Impressive ship, isn't she? Oh, that she is, Captain. Of course, I'd want to own her myself, and not have corporate pencil pushers staring over my shoulder all of the time. The man leaned in a little closer to Tarsic. You and me both. They joined each other in a small laugh. Deutron Cal. Former service captain? Actually, I... The man's words were interrupted, as Commander Von Braun came walking up from behind the men. Do not socialise with that man, Captain. Yes, ma'am. Cal responded, as he snapped to attention. Essa approached Tarsic and his men. She looked all three of them over before speaking. Well... What good luck that I get to have my old friends as guests aboard my station. What brings you out here, Captain? A change in contract? Otherwise, you'd never see me or my ship anywhere near the crux. I can guarantee you that. Oh. How is your ship? Still the best ship in the service, Tarsic grinned. This seemed to get a bit of a rise out of the commander, but she hid most of her reaction from her men. Well, our station isn't the best place for leisure activities, but if you'd like, I would gladly grant shore leave to your crew. Your offer is quite gracious, but they're quite content aboard the Honshu. Jones almost interjected. He could see what looked like a bar down the long corridor they were standing in, but decided that it was in his best interest to keep his mouth shut. If it's all the same to you, Commander, we'd just like to get our paperwork filled out and be on our way. What with the 24-hour journey out of the crux and all. Von Braun paused for a moment and wrinkled her nose. Over dinner, Captain. I'll sign your paperwork over dinner. Commander, we really... I must insist, Captain. You and your first officer will join me for dinner. It's only two hours from now. And then we'll get you on your way. Your crewman here is welcome to enjoy our facilities while he waits. Tarsic glanced down the corridor and noticed the bar. Of all things, this station just had to have a bar, didn't it? Crewman Jones can return to the ship. He may enjoy our facilities while he waits. And with that, she turned and walked away. Always such a lovely woman, Ansel said sarcastically, more to himself than to anyone in particular. Captain Tarsic turned and saw the jubilant look on Jones's face, a look that disappeared almost instantly. May I suggest something to pass the time, Captain? Deutron Cal offered. What might that be, Captain? It would be my pleasure to give you a tour of the Prometheus. Chapter 6 Deutron Cal was proud of his ship. Well, it wasn't really his ship, but still, Captain Tarsic could see why. The Prometheus bristled with all of the latest technology. Molecular recombiners for food synthesis, quantum teleporters, and even a Vulcan cannon that the Honshu scan had missed. Tarsic had done a good job of keeping his own ship up to date, despite her age but this monstrosity was a whole different breed. IPH had plenty of money to throw around, and it showed. When the Honshu was built, no one would have ever been so frivolous with space or weight for many of the items he took note of that existed on the ship. Most for no purpose other than to be decorative. The cockpit seats were as plush as one could imagine them, with a plethora of settings to adjust the pilot's body. 
embossed plaques with company logos hung above nearly every doorway. Fancy blue lights ran along every corridor, not to provide lighting, but simply to hold together some theme that the designers had thought was necessary. It wasn't. A rocket ship existed to perform a task, not to be the plaything of some art student who'd never set boot off planet. Impressed as he was by the overall cleanliness and aesthetic of the ship, none of which really mattered, he knew that his old girl was still superior in most respects. Sure, the Prometheus had a few more gizmos, but most of them weren't all that vital, and everything about the layout of this new ship suggested one thing. She was built with the new mindset that a rocket didn't need to be overly tough if it was sophisticated enough. He knew from personal experience that the Honshu could survive a crash landing. He doubted the same could be said about such a modern craft. Likely, any rescue crew would find only bits scattered about the landscape, the idea of a crash never even being given any real thought. Surely the technology will negate the possibility of a crash, would have been the mantra of the pencil pushers who'd drawn up her plans. In fact, only two things truly impressed Tarsic about this new ship. One was her lavish recreation hall that easily put the Honshu's mess to shame, and the other was that Vulcan cannon. Impressed? Probably wasn't the right term for it. Terrified was probably more accurate. The captain had been rather surprised when Deutron Cal had offered information on his ship's tactical capabilities. But he supposed that, in reality, it did no harm to be open about such things. Capable of firing super-energetic plasma at temperatures in excess of 10,000 degrees Kelvin, Vulcan cannons were a great deterrent against piracy. They weren't meant to disable ships. They were meant to melt hulls and depressurize compartments, or cook everything inside. Perhaps Cal had shared that little tidbit of information, hoping that Tarsic would spread the word that IPH meant business. He had no idea what was up Esser von Braun's sleeve, but he hoped that it didn't include the Honshu being at the receiving end of that weapon. Chapter 7 Captain Tarsic's mother had insisted on reading to him at night when he was a child, and not stories from the telenet like most normal parents. Somehow she'd managed to procure a collection of ancient books. They were actual books made of paper and cardboard, and had drawings of places and characters that never existed save for in the mind's eye of the long-dead writer. The dining hall aboard Aeolus felt so completely incongruent with the rest of the station, inasmuch as it seemed to come straight from one of those time-worn volumes about castles, princesses, and dragons. None of the stark white decor, instead, tall marble columns rose up on each side of the twenty-metre-long hall, and a massive Brazilian rosewood table stretched nearly the entirety of its length, as Captain Tarsic and Ansel made their way to their seats near the large window that looked out into the gaseous expanse of the crux, near where Essa von Braun sat at the head of the table. The Martian leaned in close and whispered to his superior, These corporation types sure do like to waste money, don't they? The captain nodded in agreement. It was disgusting. Servants, clad in fine evening dress, pulled their chairs out and helped them get situated at the enormous table. The station's commander could only smile at them as they got comfortable. She then waved at her servants to dismiss them once they had done their jobs. The first course, Fentac soup and ogre bread, was already on the table, and without as much as a greeting, 
Ansel began to dig in. With the lighting in the dining hall being considerably darker than the rest of the station, the Martian had removed his goggles and proceeded to stare down Essa as he filled his mouth with soup-covered bread and began to chew. The station commander took a long sip from her wine glass and spoke. I get the sensation that you're not terribly happy to share my company, Mr. Ansel. His only response was to continue his gaze as he proceeded to sop up more of the surprisingly tasty soup. Captain Tarsic had yet to touch his food. He sat there like a giant statue, with his arms spread, flanking his soup bowl and wine glass, and said nothing. Something wrong with your food, Captain? Essa von Braun asked. I promise you, it's not been poisoned. Tarsic did have to admit that the thought had not occurred to him. Ansel instantly dropped the piece of bread he was holding into his bowl of soup with a splash, and it was quite clear that he hadn't considered that possibility either. Normally the two spacemen were quite alert to threats, but poisoning enemies aboard a corporate space station just didn't seem like something even von Braun was stupid enough to try, commander of said outpost or not. With a smile that said, I call your bluff, the captain tore off a piece of his bread and dipped it into the lovely smelling soup. Smells delicious, he stated, then took a large bite. It should. My personal chef studied on Calamus Four under Arturio Fenemek himself. Name dropping. How exactly like you, Essa. The station commander swirled the wine in her glass in thought for a moment, as her guests finished off their small portions of soup. When the two men finished their food, a couple of small, shiny orb-like robos dropped from the ceiling and collected them with spindly little robotic arms, and flew them away to be cleaned. Right on cue, three servers came trotting into the dining hall, and put the second course down onto the table. Essa hadn't partaken in any of the soup, but this time they did put food down in front of her, as well as the two guests. Steam wafted off of the dishes, as the shiny silver lids were removed. Plank roasted salmon, Captain. Tarsic waited for the service to leave the room before he spoke. If you're trying to impress us, you don't need to keep laying on the ostentation. You've succeeded. Ansel managed to chuckle in between gulps of wine. Yep, what he said, but feel free to keep the food coming. He smiled as he picked up his fork and eyed the salmon. Look, Harador. She used the familiar, knowing that it would irritate him. We both know that there's a question you're dying to ask me, so I'll save you the trouble. Tarsic demonstrated his disdain for her by digging into his food with abandon, while simultaneously keeping his gaze fixed on her. A sarcastic smirk etched into his face. By all means, I'm dying with anticipation. Please, proceed, he said, as he waved a fork full of salmon at her, his mouth full of food, and not very worried about getting some of it on her fancy table. This caused Ansel to chuckle. Over years of friendship, Captain Tarsic had rubbed off quite a bit on the Martian, making him a much tougher individual but the exchange had been a two-way one. Haridor had picked up a healthy dose of Ansel's snarky sense of humour as well. Essa von Braun kept her stone-faced, yet smugly polite demeanour as she spoke. You, no doubt, are very interested in how I became the commanding officer of a corporate space station, a security firm, no less, especially after that nasty business the last time we crossed paths. Yeah, you might say that. This time, it was Ansel's turn to rudely speak with his mouth full of fish. 
The commander, finally becoming mildly annoyed, said nothing as she pressed a button on her bracelet that summoned the little cleaning robos. They dropped in from the ceiling and picked up the plates, all except hers, in an instant. Tarsic and Ansel were left sitting there, with mouths full of food and dirty silverware, surprised looks on both of their faces. Their forks made a series of loud metallic clangs that rang out through the large dining hall as they dropped them, small bits of fish scattering all over the Brazilian rosewood in the process. They both turned their attention to Essa von Braun, who was smiling as she finally picked up her own fork and looked at the wonderful meal in front of her. Well, now that I have your attention, she didn't even bother looking up. Let me lay it out for you. Thanks to you, Captain, I spent three years in lockup on Subterra Prime. Mmm, mmm, she moaned in delight as she took her first bite. I met a Frasian girl in there named Tali Asadan Fal Falul. Does that name sound familiar to either of you? She looked at them quizzically as she chewed her fish. Ansel thought the name sounded remotely familiar, but couldn't place it. Captain Tarsic had never heard the first name before, but the surname was identifiable. His look informed Commander von Braun that he knew who she was talking about. That's right, the daughter of Qualda Asadan Falfa Falul, chairman of the Board of Directors for Interplanetary Holdings. I recognised the name as well, and not being one to miss an opportunity, I took that poor frightened girl under my wing. A cute young Frasian was an easy target in a dungeon like Subterra. I kept her safe from the violent and perverse inmates as best I could. And when we got released, her father saw fit to thank me for my kindness. She grinned from ear to ear. Good thing you took my plate away, otherwise I might have choked on my food, Ansel commented. So, you faked kindness in order to curry some favour at a later date. Doesn't surprise me one bit, to be honest. But if you're telling the truth, what in the galaxy could a rich girl like the daughter of IPH's chairman have possibly done to end up in a place like Subterra? She was a petty little bitch, had her husband killed by a bounty hunter named Carson Desrick because she thought he was cheating on her. She decided to stiff Desrick on the payment, so he dumped all of the information he had about the incident onto some data tapes and had them delivered to the Frasian system's supreme magistrate. It's easy for a bounty hunter to disappear for good, but Tali had nowhere to go. Her father's pull got her a short sentence, of course, but still, she had to serve at least some time. So, Chairman Qualder entrusted a new, and likely quite expensive, security facility to a known criminal such as yourself, just because you kept a bunch of angry and very sexually frustrated convicts away from his daughter, while she served time for first-degree murder. Von Braun was silent for a moment. Did I not hit the nail on the head? Essa polished off the last bit of her wine and put her fork down onto her plate with an audible clang. Tali and I both ended up on the same transport, leaving Subterra. It was attacked by pirates. Why? I have no idea. Looking for conscripts, I suppose. I killed one of the bastards myself by strangling him with my shackles, took his gun, and proceeded to capture their captain. For all that I'd done for his daughter, Chairman Qualder helped me have my criminal misdeeds erased from my permanent record, and gave me a job captaining a low-priority freighter. A couple of years later, my convoy was attacked by pirates, not being the type to just roll over. She smiled at Tarsic. I rallied my battered collection of lightly armed and antique vessels, and not only fought them off, but managed to chase them all the way back to their base, 
My ragtag little fleet kept them pinned down until system police forces arrived and blasted them into oblivion. That got you noticed, of course, Ansel sneered. Chairman Qualder, Essa cut him off, had been looking for an opportunity to promote me. He trusted me, but some of those on his board of directors were a little more cautious. Helping take down that pirate outpost was more than enough to ease their concerns, and he offered me a very important assignment, IPH's new ultra-high security facility, Aeolus. So, a pirate got the job of running a bank by fighting off other pirates. That's classic, Captain Tarsic snickered. Essa didn't even flinch at the insult. Instead, she took another bite of the lovely fish that had been so rudely taken away from the two men only moments earlier. No longer wanting to play footsie with his old rival, the captain spoke up. Essa, let's cut the shit, shall we? We made our delivery. The fact that we're still here means you've got something to say to me. The station commander placed her utensils onto her plate. Her facial expression changed instantly. You're absolutely right, Harry. Captain Tarsic winced at the sound of his name being said so familiarly by such a woman, but he was interrupted by the beeping of the telewave on his belt. Without even considering politeness or table manners, he slapped the button that activated it. Captain, it's Faust, came the voice over the scratchy communications channel. We've got armed station security men at the hatch, demanding that we break seal and submit to an inspection. You keep that hatch sealed, pilot. And anyone that tries to force their way aboard, you have my personal orders to open fire upon. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Understood. The transmission cut off, and was replaced with static for a moment, before it went completely silent. Tarsic and Ansel jumped from their seats in unison. What the hell is going on, Von Braun? The captain instinctively reached for a spiral ray gun as he spoke, but his fingers found nothing. It was still aboard the Honshu, sitting in his equipment locker. Essa wiped her mouth with her napkin and placed it gently onto the table, keeping the suspense up as long as possible before standing as well. You know, I offered for your entire crew to come onto the station for leave, but I knew that would never work. Not because it aroused your suspicions, I knew they'd already be aroused. But because you'd never take the time for a little break. It's always work, work, work with you, isn't it? She didn't wait for her question to be answered. To put it simple, Captain... We received a telewave shortly before your arrival from a ship called the Idris. She'd picked up a distress call from a planet called Casella. The natives there claimed that a ship called the Honshu had stolen a rather sizable quantity of precious minerals from them. Captain Tarsic, hell, none of the Honshu's crew would have ever thought that the backward Kashyyyk tribesmen had anything like a telewave transmitter. Little did they know that the tribesmen had salvaged one from a crashed merchant vessel decades ago, and that a Breckish merchant had fixed it and shown them what it was used for only a short time before their visit. Regardless, the Honshu's records would clearly show that there was a contract, and that it was fulfilled. They had done nothing wrong. It was the natives who had breached the contract, not them. A bribe, Tarsic chuckled. Is that what you want, Essa? A bribe? Of course not, she scoffed. I am the commanding officer of a rather prestigious space station. Why would I do something illegal like that and risk everything? What do you want, then? Ansel spoke this time. I want to put you, she pointed at the Martian and then slowly moved her finger toward the captain. And you, 
in lockup while we investigate what happened on Casella. And I want to rip that ship of yours apart, looking for contraband. I want to follow the letter of the law, Captain. No more, and no less. And with that, a wicked smile crossed her middle-aged face. One that was topped by dirty blonde hair, which was slowly starting to show the signs of grey. If you touch my ship, I'll... I wouldn't continue that statement, Captain. Not unless you want to add threatening an IPH official to the list of possible charges. Fine. But you're not getting aboard my ship. I will not give the order to allow your men on board. Captain, it's very likely that our investigation could take several days. Perhaps even a week. But you do understand that until we get aboard and inspect your ship, that we will be unable to complete it. And that means you'll be stuck here indefinitely. Tarsic knew exactly what she was doing. She couldn't risk her career by doing anything contrary to the law. But she'd manipulate the rules to keep the honshu out of work, for as long as possible. If he let her men onto the ship, they'd do a good job of tearing her up, before finally concluding that everything was indeed on the up and up. And they'd be on their way with a ship that had been ransacked and a week or so of lost pay. On the other hand, if he refused to cooperate, they'd detain Ansel, Jones, and himself, until he finally agreed to let them search his ship. He decided that the best course of action was to do exactly what von Braun was trying to do to him piss her off. At least for the time being. My ship stays sealed. Anyone tries to board her by force, and they get burned down. Is that clear? He knew that IPH had the right to search any ship docked at their facility, if it gave permission, but that they had no legal recourse if permission was denied. They could have called in a police ship if they were inside the jurisdiction of a star system, but they weren't. If they forced their way onto the Honshu, the crew would have every right to protect themselves, it was a stalemate. Quite clear, Captain. But let's see what a few days in holding does to your attitude. She pressed a button on the lapel of the dark grey cape that was integrated into her uniform, and the main entrance to the dining hall slid open with a hiss. Standing in it were two security men wearing ray-proof armour and carrying stun pistols. With the most sarcastic smile and tone of voice he could muster, Ansel turned to Essa von Braun. Well, thanks for dinner. It's always lovely to see you again, dear. Chapter 8 Emily Faust and Dr. Ramos sat in the loading bay staring up at a screen that had been installed to monitor conditions just outside of each bay door. Two images on the screen showed nothing but empty platform, but one of them, from the camera facing the station, now showed five men wearing armour and wielding proton rifles. One of them was using the butt of his gun to rap hard on the door itself, but with the honshu's thick armour, the sound was barely audible inside the craft. They'd been standing out there for fifteen minutes, Faust said to her colleague. You'd think they'd have gotten the hint by now, eh? The doctor was a handsome sort of fellow, a little past middle age, his dark skin clearly showing his ancient Indian heritage. His hair had begun to grey heavily at the temples, but he managed to stay nearly wrinkle-free. He was about the oldest person on board, so to them he was the old man, but most folks wouldn't have seen him that way. Typically, he wasn't much of a talker, unless it was to scold one of his patients for not following orders. This time, he simply smiled at the young pilot and nodded. Over the last few minutes, the situation had slowly turned from worrisome to comedic. The crewmen who'd been assigned to guard the bay 
had since started an impromptu game of cards, out of sheer boredom, while the two senior officers spoke. The armed men outside had absolutely no hope of breaking into the ship, with the relatively light arms that they carried, and they seemed to think that if they just kept banging on the hull long enough, someone would eventually let them in. Okay, Doctor. The captain is incommunicado, and we've got armed thugs knocking at our door. Any suggestions? Don't look at me, Miss Faust. With the captain and first officer MIA, you're the one who's in command now. Well, our last order was to keep the ship sealed, and that's exactly what we'll do. Obviously we can't lift with the captain and Ansel still aboard the station, so... We sit here and wait. For what? Firstly, you forgot about poor crewman Jones who's also on that station. Secondly, you should know by now that Captain Tarsic always has a plan. Well, he almost always has a plan. I did not forget about Jones, Doctor. I was just trying to be economical with words. Ramos chuckled. She wasn't what he'd call overly talkative, at least not to the point of being annoying. But economical with words was not a phrase he'd used to describe the pilot. What's so funny? Is my relative silence starting to rub off on you, pilot? I say relative because most of the gas bags on this ship are completely unfamiliar with the concept of closing their mouths. Even when they're just sitting there respirating... Faust gave him a look that said, not amused, then reached for the telewave on her belt. She tapped a few keys that patched it into the ship's external speakers. Hey, you! The booming voice apparently startled the armed men, and both Faust and the doctor laughed when they visibly jumped with a start on the monitor. I suggest you gents jet off before I decide to fire up my engines and make toast out of all of you. You're not getting in here with anything short of an A-bomb, boys. The two sat and watched as the men finally seemed to give up and head back to the station airlock. Okay, Doc, I'm going to head back up to the cockpit. If anyone else comes knocking, don't hesitate to tell them we don't want any. Ramos shook his head and smiled as the pretty young pilot walked away and jumped onto the access tube's ladder that would give her a relatively quick trip up to the cockpit from the loading bay. It was a hell of a climb, but she was tenacious enough to not let it bother her. He couldn't help but think to himself about just how much Captain Tarsic had been rubbing off on that poor young lady. Chapter 9 Okay, that's not going to work, Ansel declared as he jumped back from the holding cell's door. The Martian could always be counted on to have a couple of tools stashed somewhere on his person, and this occasion was no different. He dared to fiddle around with the force field emitter that was preventing them from leaving. Well, there was also a couple of guards in the hallway, but guards had never stopped them before. The captain had had his fill of Essa von Braun's shenanigans. To hell with her, and to hell with IPH. If they manage to bust free of Aeolus, they may never get any work with interplanetary holdings again, but no court in the known universe would hold them on any kind of criminal charges. The service takes care of its own. They'd see that the Honshu had never violated contract, and that Von Braun had used her position to try and settle a personal score against Tarsic and his men. Chairman Qualder may have helped wipe her criminal records, but the service still had its own records, and knew very well who she was, and what misdeeds she had been party to. "'What about you, Jones? Any ideas?' the captain asked. "'Then again, never mind.' I forgot that you were busy getting drunk while we were having to put up with Essa von Braun's bullshit. Jones was lying on one of the cots 
nursing a headache. He'd apparently wasted zero time getting himself intoxicated. If it makes you feel any better, sir, they had the worst booze this side of the Xerxes system. The captain tapped his now non-functional telewave that the guards hadn't even bothered to remove. Note to self. Put Crewman Jones off at the next barely habitable rock. See? I knew you had a sense of humour, sir. You get your ass up and help us figure out a way out of here, Crewman. Or you might have to learn the hard way, the difference between when I'm joking and when I'm not. Jones sat up and shook his head. There's far too much power going through those emitters for me to risk messing with them again, Ansel stated. What about the Honshu? Is there any way she could disrupt the station's power, even for a moment? Ansel sat down next to Jones and thought about it for a few moments. Well, and I'm not even sure this would work. I'm listening. Nah. What? I just don't know enough about the station, and how she functions. I don't even know what kind of power core she has. Great. The captain threw his hands up in frustration. What about the guards? Jones finally had something to contribute to the conversation. Couldn't we just tell them that one of us is sick and needs a doctor? They come in and wham, we clobber them. You've seen way too many vids, haven't you? Ansel said, staring Jones straight in the eyes with a very serious expression. Wait, maybe he's not that stupid. I mean, maybe he's unintentionally less stupid than we think. The guards might actually fall for it if they have a genuine reason to think that one of us is actually hurt. How do we make them think that we're actually hurt? Ansel asked. There's no way we're getting through this force field. We know that, and the guards know that. It does put off a mild electric discharge, though, and... Jones interrupted. Service uniforms help deflect electrical discharges. It would seem that the crewman isn't so dumb after all. Right. I get the guard's attention and run into that sucker at full force and pretend that the shock knocked me unconscious. They come in to see about me. We beat the rocket fuel out of them. The captain then turned back to Jones. Interrupt me again, though, and I'll punch you right in the mouth, crewman. Clear? Jones shook his head in acknowledgement and Ansel stood up and helped him to his feet. You ready for this, or should we let you sober up for a while? The Martian asked. Are you kidding me? I fight best when I've got a little sauce in me. Fine. Follow my lead. With that, the first officer grabbed his captain's sizable right bicep. It took Jones a moment to figure out what was going on, but he got the drift and grabbed Tarsic's left arm. I've had it! The captain yelled out at the top of his voice. I'll tear those IPH space dogs limb from limb! Come and fight like men, you cowards! Jones looked at Ansel with questioning eyes, but the first officer's nod told him to just keep playing along. I'll bet I've had my way with most of your mothers, you dung heaps! Let me go, let me go! The guards came around the corner and saw Tarsic being held back by his own two men, and screaming at the top of his lungs. A large vein was protruding from his forehead, and only added to the illusion that the rather sizable space captain seemed as if he'd gone completely off his rocker. There you are, you cowards! You tell that commander of yours that I've got a merry-go-round for her! And candies for everyone! Except the dog. He can get his own. Space madness, we think. Our doctor thought he was close to a breakdown already. Ansel yelled over the insane ramblings of his commanding officer. Just shut him up before we have someone come in and sedate him. One of the guards declared. The men in the hallway never saw Captain Tarsic tap his men on their sides. His signal for them to let him go. 
he lunged forward heavily, and both Ansel and Jones feigned weakness as they let him slip from their grasp. The burly space captain launched forward like a rocket and smashed into the faint rippling blue haze that was the force field. Despite the fact that he could never have penetrated it with brute force alone, the guards still took a step back instinctively. The shield erupted in electrical arcs and threw the captain backwards several feet, right into the waiting arms of his men. They caught him and let him down to the ground. Absolutely taken aback, the security men had no idea how to respond. Finally, fully grasping the plan, Jones bent down on one knee and reached for the captain's neck. There's no pulse! He yelled, at no one in particular. Ansel looked up at the two stunned guards and shouted, Don't just stand there! Help us, damn it! Without giving it much thought, exactly as the captain had hoped, the taller of the two guards reached for the device on his belt that shut off the force field. He mashed its crystal-like button that immediately went from a glowing blue colour to a faint white. None of the Honshu crew knew what IPH non-commission rank insignia stood for, but the taller man was obviously in charge as he ordered the shorter guard to go through the door first. Check him out, the taller guard commanded. Yes, sir, the subordinate said, as he shoved Jones out of the way and reached for Captain Tarsic's neck. Jones caught the look of surprise on the guard's face as he felt a nice strong pulse, but before he could utter a word, the captain caught him with an uppercut straight to the sternum. Faster than any of them could believe such a large fellow was capable of moving, he then grabbed the second officer's ankle and pulled his leg out from under him. The man hit the floor so hard that the wind was knocked out of him, and Ansel was on top of him instantly. Nighty-night, sunshine! With that, he punched the guard square in the face with all of his strength. He checked to make sure the man was indeed unconscious, before getting to his feet and turning to his captain. I was going to ask if you're okay, but I guess I have my answer already. Still hurt like hell the captain declared. My head's spinning a little bit, but I'll be all right. That force field packs a hell of a wallop, service uniform or no. The captain, Ansel, and Jones made sure to grab anything that might be of use off of the unconscious guards, including their telewaves and stun pistols. Before reactivating the shield, Tarsic gave each man a quick blast from their own weapons to make sure they'd be out for at least an hour. With a quick press, the crystal once again lit up with a bright blue glow, and the force field was back in place. They were in luck. The station's holding facility was rather small, and seemed to have no further guards on duty. Whether or not this was the only brig on board, none of them knew, but the fact that it was basically now in their control boded well. They used a nearby security console to bring up a basic layout of the facility. Unfortunately for them, they quickly learned that they were now on the opposite side of the station from where the Honshu was docked. Well, that's just great. How in this space-blasted hell are we supposed to get clear across this station without being seen? Jones moaned. Oh, and let's not forget that they'll probably be calling to check in with their guards any minute now, and will notice something is up. Ansel's only response was to hold up one of the guard's telewaves in his left hand, while his right continued to work the console's keyboard. It's a shame we didn't stop to ask them for their names, in case someone called for them. The captain's typical confident smile had returned. Good with impressions, are we, sir? Stow it, crewman. Ansel barked at Jones. Captain, it looks like there are maintenance paths that run parallel to most of the main corridors. But there's one major problem. Why is that not surprising? What is it? The station is arranged like a flower, with the docking platforms being the petals. 
The centre hub of the facility branches out from a circular core into thick spokes that the platforms are attached to. Those outer areas, like where we entered, are hardened to prevent anyone from breaking into the station, but they seem pretty soft on security as far as actually leaving is concerned. The problem is that all of the maintenance paths terminate close to the centre of the facility. That's where the main vaults are located, so security is extra tight in those areas. So, if we use one of those paths, we run into a dead end near the centre of the station. Exactly. Finally, having something useful to contribute, Jones piped up. These are MU-9 stun pistols, Captain. I could rig one of their power cells to explode. Maybe that could blast right through the dead end and into the central core. In fact, look. He walked over to a nearby weapons locker. I'm pretty sure this thing is full of MU-9s that we could rig into a bomb. Captain Tarsic did not want to dampen his young cohort's enthusiasm, but they had to be realistic. That's a hell of a maybe there, Jones. The bomb might not work, and even if it did, we'd still only be halfway across the station. I'm also not okay with the possibility of killing anyone in that blast, IPH personnel included. There's also another concern, sir. Tarsic turned to Ansel. You're right. That space-blasted tower that generates the atmosphere and gravity on the landing platform. Without that, we'd be popsicles in a matter of seconds. Ooh, goodies. Jones had used a key taken from the head guard to open the locker. Pretty sure these'll come in handy. Three more MU-9s and... whatever this is. Let me see. The captain walked over and grabbed the item. Portable force shield. Definitely handy. This is mine. The device was basically a handle with a button on it, but when activated, was capable of generating a shield that would absorb physical blows, as well as the discharges from energy weapons. At least for a few minutes, until its power supply was exhausted. After tucking the device into his belt, and giving Jones a look of haughty derision, for his heavy smell of alcohol. The captain walked back over to Ansel, still messing with the console, and leaned in to whisper. Got anything yet? Captain Tarsic liked to project an air of invincibility, and didn't want Jones, or any subordinate for that matter, to get the impression that he did not have a plan. It wasn't arrogance. He simply knew that his crew would function more efficiently if they had complete confidence in their leader. He would always give Ansel, or any crew member for that matter, credit for solving a problem, but in the heat of the moment, he always liked to look like he was in control. It probably wasn't necessary at this moment, seeing as how Jones was the only one around to see it, and had probably already assumed there was no real plan. But old habits die hard, well, I'll be honest with you, this station was laid out pretty well to prevent. Both men's eyes went wide, at the sound of one of the guards' telewave crackling to life. Sergeant Craig Smith, quarter hour status report. Jones turned around, and despite his drunkenness, caught sight of the alarm on his superiors' faces. Captain Tarsic hesitated for a moment and then activated the telewave. Sergeant Craig Smith here. He looked at Ansel questioningly, and all the Martian could do was shrug. Situation normal. Nothing to report. The voice on the other end went silent for a moment. Sergeant, please confirm your authentication code. Plan B, the captain yelled out. Ansel jumped from the console's chair and grabbed one of the stun pistols. What's plan B? Jones asked, as the two other men began bolting for the door. Run, Jones. 
Whenever I say plan B, that means run. Chapter 10 This had better be some kind of joke, Lieutenant. Did you suddenly develop a sense of humour? Essa von Braun screeched at the man who stood in her doorway. She was already in her nightgown and had taken her hair down from the business-like bun that she usually kept it in. No, ma'am. They took everyone completely by surprise. With only one ship docked and no others on scanners, most of our men were on stand-down. No doubt getting drunk in Halloway's infernal bar. I'm going to revoke his occupational permit first thing in the morning, she shouted as she walked over to the dresser at the opposite end of her quarters. With nearly 600 square feet of living space, her accommodations were nearly three times larger than most, but despite having a taste for decorating her office and the dining hall elaborately, her quarters were furnished in a very Spartan fashion. That was Essa von Braun, though. Put on a good show to impress others, but when it came down to it, she only wanted two things. Money and power. The man standing in her open doorway averted his eyes as she quickly stripped and started fumbling to get into her uniform. In fact, she started, as she reached for the weapon stashed in the drawer of her nightstand. I'll never understand why corporate even allows private businesses on the station. If you ask me, it's only competition. Competition, Mum? It's a bar. Yes, and IPH could just as well run their own and keep all of the profits. What the lieutenant didn't know was that Essa had no intention of revoking Holloway's permit. She'd spoken harshly in a moment of anger, but in truth, she liked having the private establishments on Aeolus. She could squeeze them for extra cash that was easy to keep under the table. The second thing that Lieutenant Okeke didn't know was that the weapon stashed in the commander's drawer was a klepton arm 7Z. Even more so than Captain Tarsic's sidearm of choice. The KA-7Z was a nasty weapon. So nasty, in fact, that it was highly illegal to even possess. It fired a proton burst like most ray pistols, but also delivered a heavy dose of radiation with each shot. Anything that it hit, if it didn't die from the initial discharge, was doomed to a slow lingering death from radiation poisoning. Let's go, she barked as she holstered her weapon. Dr. Ramus sat in the ship's cockpit, along with Emily Faust and junior pilot Sam Herschel. They'd been attempting to break through the jamming signal that the station was broadcasting, but with no luck. Suddenly, one of the lights on Herschel's console lit up, and he tapped a few keys before turning to the others with a puzzled look on his face. What is it, Herschel? I'm not sure, ma'am. Scanners are picking up some strange energy discharges, very faint, but coming from inside the station. The doctor put his head into his hands and let out a sigh. Herschel looked at the pilot with a quizzical expression, not understanding what was going on. The doctor here thinks that the captain has become impatient with our hosts and is attempting to effect self-release. Mom? This time the doctor interjected. He's shooting up the place. What? That's insane! He'll end up in prison, probably with us right alongside him. Faust allowed herself a quick chuckle. Mr. Herschel, you haven't been on board all that long. Let me explain something to you. The captain may seem like a maniac at times, but he knows what he's doing. Once we're clear of the station, IPH won't be able to touch us. It'll all be a big misunderstanding. Well, that is... She bit her lip and thought. What? If he doesn't kill anybody, of course. 
but I know Captain Tarsic. He's not that stupid. She's right, the doctor interjected. Captain knows what he's doing. He paused for a moment. Then again, with that thing, he pointed out of the window and toward where the light had been on the nearby tower. Not activated, he probably doesn't have everything worked out just yet. Emily Faust straightened up in her seat. You're right. How in the hell are they going to get from the airlock to the ship? Is there anything we can do from here? Dr. Ramos asked, now genuinely concerned. If they could get the doors open, we could bring them their bubbles. Good try, pilot. But what about that automated sentry gun? She rubbed her chin for a moment in thought. Any ideas, Herschel? Sam looked around the cockpit, as if the question had somehow been directed at another Herschel that was present. I... How would I know what to do? Well, Faust responded, At the moment, you're probably the best technical mind we've got on the ship. Herschel scoffed at the absurdity. He knew a little about some basic engineering concepts. But really, he was only qualified to fix basic things around the ship. His skills didn't extend far beyond handyman. Now if Ansel was aboard, he could probably think of something. But he wasn't. He was in there and had no way to get back to the ship. The pilot and the doctor fixated on him with questioning eyes. Crap. Emily broke the silence. What about that auxiliary crewman? What's his name? Uh, Stilwitz, is it? Didn't he fix the relay to that Nutriven that was causing the whole thing to overload and make nothing but piles of bratwurst? Wait, wait, wait. Herschel piped up. Could we overload that tower some kind of way? That's an interesting idea, but I don't know. That's why we were asking you, Herschel. The junior pilot stood up and began to pace in the small cockpit. He rubbed his beard in thought. Okay, let's pretend for a moment that I have even the slightest inkling about what I'm doing. Faust gave him a sarcastic nod, while the doctor only raised a questioning eyebrow. The Honshu is an old design, and back in those days, most ships had a device for wirelessly transferring power from one ship to another. It was in case their fusion core stalled, and they needed a jump to get it going again. You see, back then ships didn't have the battery capacity to hold enough charge to restart their own cores. Well, not unless they were going into uncharted space and loaded them down with extra batteries. But whenever they were within telewave range of help, they didn't bother. Do we even still have that device on the ship? The captain has made tons of changes over the years. Faust had little confidence that they did, and even if it was still physically in place, she doubted that it would function any longer. Herschel sat back down at his console and began tapping away at the controls furiously. A moment later, the cockpit screen crackled and slowly came to life. On it appeared to be a diagram of the internals of the ship. Look, Sam said, as the schematic began to zoom in to a spot a few decks below the cockpit. The data tapes call it a tap, or teleceiver for auxiliary power. It looks like ours are still in place. But, the doctor asked, it looks like when the Mark IX cannon was installed, the power conduits connecting it to the grid were rerouted. Without wasting a moment, Emily Faust reached for the microphone that hung over her chair and barked an order into it. Any and all crewmen with mechanical skills are to report to Junior Pilot Herschel on Deck 4 immediately. This is an emergency, people. Get to it, or you will... or you will have to answer to me. What? A stunned Herschel asked his commanding officer. We need that tap back online as soon as possible. Get your ass down there, mister. That's an order. The poor boy looked terrified as he left the cockpit. Dr. Ramos gave the pilot a little smile. 
Trial by fire, Miss Faust. Trial by fire. Let's hope he passes. Our friends' lives may count on it. Chapter 11 The poor IPH fools had never seen anything like it. The three escapees had taken them almost completely by surprise. They were now over halfway back to the docking platform, where the Honshu was located, and behind them was probably something like two dozen security men, now napping peacefully on the deck. A few of them had been wearing ray-proof armour, but most of them hadn't. Jones and Ansel each had two of the MU-9 stun pistols, and the crewman was proving to be a crack shot, even in his current state. Captain Tarsic held one of the weapons in his right hand, while holding the portable force shield in the other. By basically rushing everyone they'd come across, they'd been lucky. Very lucky. All of their startled opponent's stun bursts or proton blasts had either missed completely or impacted on the shield harmlessly. This would definitely be a story to tell over drinks in the mess hall. Of that, all of them were certain. There was still the matter of the air and gravity generator, but Plan B didn't exactly have a contingency for every situation. They'd have to wing it. The station security had apparently finally gotten its act together, as they were beginning to encounter more organised resistance. But even the three armed and armoured men who confronted them in the next corridor had no chance. In an instant, the captain was upon them, and smashed through their ranks with the force of all 300 pounds of raw muscle at his disposal. Between the zap from the force shield and the captain basically flattening them, they were easy targets for Ansel and Jones. Quickly turning back, they fired a few stun bursts into the unarmoured parts of the men's bodies. As they approached the corridor that led from the central part of the station and into the spoke, that radiated out into the docking platform where the ship was docked. They began to take fire from the level above. The captain raised the force shield over his head to act as a sort of umbrella. It worked and prevented any of the fire coming from above from hitting them. But while preoccupied with their overhead attackers, one of the IPH men came from an auxiliary corridor and got the captain in his sights. Ansel raised his own weapon and fired it, just as his opponent did. The Martian shot was true, right into the unarmoured man's chest. The security man must have panicked as he'd fired, because his shot went low and caught Captain Tarsic in the lower leg. Service uniforms had an ability to deflect at least a small amount of fire from an energy weapon, but some of the stun burst still managed to work its way into his calf muscles. Ansel quickly caught his comrade, as the two of them collapsed to the floor in a heap. Jones, unexpectedly, had dodged the force shield as it came crashing down onto both the first officer and the captain, and instead jumped right out into the open. He dodged a couple of proton blasts, and managed to take out the two men firing at them from above. Both of them collapsed precariously onto the railing, that kept their unconscious bodies from taking a twenty-foot plunge to the hard deck below. "'You two okay?' Jones asked, as he ran up and knelt beside his shipmates. "'Damn good shooting there, Jones,' the captain said with a wry smile, that signalled that he was fine. First Officer Ansel appeared to be a bit more shaken up, but he was fully capable of keeping himself together. This was far from the first firefight he'd ever been in, and he knew all too well that it wouldn't be the last. Help me get him up, Ansel ordered. Tarsic deactivated his shield to make it easier for them to get him to his feet. It took some doing, but they managed, and he found that he was able to move his leg just fine, but that it was quite numb, and he had to be very careful about how he walked. Sure wish we'd thought to grab some armour off of those guards we clobbered, the captain groaned. I'll be okay, though. Good, then, Ansel chimed in. Just a little further. He reached out his hand to help steady the captain, but Tarsic would have none of it. 
What the hell do we do about the platform, though? We can't just walk out there. He looked at both of his men, to see if any of them had any ideas, because for once, he certainly knew that he did not. Actually, sir, I was thinking about when we first... Jones was cut off by the sound of proton blasts striking the nearby bulkhead. Down! The captain shouted as they ducked behind the closest wall and squatted down low. They all waited for a moment, their stun pistols at the ready. But no one came around the corner. Jones checked the power cells on his guns, both down to less than 50%. Captain Tarsic! came an all-too-familiar voice. I am placing you under arrest for assaulting interplanetary holdings personnel, theft of interplanetary holdings equipment, damage to interplanetary holdings equipment and facilities, and last, but not least, interfering in a lawful investigation. Now get out here, or I swear I'll gun you down myself. I'll be damned! the captain roared as he jumped to his feet and activated the force shield. His two crewmen tried to hold him back, but even with a numb leg, he was too fast and too strong for them. Essa von Braun had never personally fought Captain Tarsic face to face, and her typical calm, or at least stalwart, appearance was shattered by the sight of the large man with his cape flapping and his face contorted into a visage of anger, rushing at her full force. She panicked and reached for her sidearm. Staring down the freight train that was Captain Tarsic, she managed to pull it from its holster quickly and get off a shot that harmlessly ricocheted off of the force field. Harmless to Tarsic, at least. Poor Lieutenant Okeke was not so lucky. He was so stunned watching the giant spacer slam into his commander that he didn't notice the proton blast that had burned itself deep into the brown flesh of his chest, until a moment later when he suddenly collapsed. The sheer force of the enraged captain's impact not only tossed Essa von Braun back several feet, but also managed to knock one of her front teeth completely out of her mouth. The captain was not one to take chances in a fight. He didn't stop until he knew his opponent was down for the count. Essa knew this because she was the exact same way. He tossed his shield aside and lunged at her to deliver a downward punch that would render her unconscious. But she was ready for it. She rolled to the side, leaving his fist to kiss nothing but cold steel. He only let the pain blind him for a split second, but that's all Essa von Braun needed. She jumped to her feet and delivered a swift kick that caught Tarsic right in the sternum. She'd been aiming for his throat, but he'd moved fast enough to keep her boot from catching that even more vulnerable spot. He braced himself for the next blow, but nothing happened. Essa backed away a few feet and raised her hands. What was happening? Oh, I've wanted to do this for a while. Ansel was standing there, with his plasma derringer in hand. This was one of the few times that the Martian actually wanted to kill someone. No! Tarsic exclaimed. No killing! He wanted to beat the tar out of Essa with his bare hands. He intended to make sure that she never dared to come up against him again. His men lowered their weapons, and the captain pulled himself to his feet. Much to his surprise, Essa reached out for the telewave on her belt and activated it. Commander von Braun to security personnel. Stand down. I repeat, stand down and return to your posts. Medical teams proceed to attend to the wounded. Mom? came the voice from her telewave. You heard me! She screamed, Stand down! Yes, ma'am. Suddenly, Essa looked down and noticed Okeke lying on the deck and clutching his wound. 
Tarsic noticed her eyes go wide in terror as she realised what he'd been hit with. That's going to be fun, eh? Explaining to your superiors why one of their officers died of radiation poisoning. The captain truly did feel sorry for the man, but taunting von Braun was just too tempting. He turned to his men. Go ahead of me and figure out how we get back to the ship. Yes, sir, Ansel replied, then tapped Jones on the arm and motioned toward the airlock. Essevon Braun was thoroughly angry. For the second time, Haridor Tarsic had managed to ruin her life, and for that, she wanted nothing less than to take his. When Lieutenant Okeke died from his wounds, there would be an investigation, and when it was found that his death was caused by her illegal sidearm, she'd be terminated from her employ of IPH, or worse yet, sent back to Subterra. What was one more murder? I'm going to rip your throat out, you space dog! She was faster than he expected, and delivered another quick kick to the sternum that nearly dropped him to his knees. She followed it with a right cross to the face, but he caught her left and twisted it hard. He wasn't sure, but he thought he heard something crack. Either nothing actually broke, or she was just so furious that she didn't even notice it, because she continued her attack. Another quick right to the face forced him to let her go, and another kick, this time to the abdomen, dropped him to the deck on hands and knees. He saw her boot come up again, but threw himself into a sideways roll to avoid it. He managed to grab the force shield from where it was lying and activated it, just as she threw another right cross. Her hand bounced off the shield with an electric sizzle, and she recoiled in pain. Her eyes filled with hatred, and she forgot herself for a moment. She swung hard with her left. It hit the shield, and her expression instantly turned to one of agony. She reeled backwards and clutched her left hand in pain. Tarsic deactivated the shield and tucked the handle into his belt, then put himself into a fighting stance once again. I thought you said you were going to kill me. Isn't that what you said, Essa? He caught the flash in her eye that betrayed her decision. His ability to read someone, an ability that had failed him earlier in the day, told him in an instant what she was about to do. As she stepped forward, her right hand went to her belt, and she pulled a thus far hidden blade from it. Captain Tarsic had been in plenty of knife fights, and knew how to handle himself. He tracked the blade in what seemed, at least to his mind, like slow motion. She thrust it forward, straight at his heart, but he grabbed her right hand with his left, and seized hold of her cape with his right. In one smooth motion, he spun her around and slammed her back into his chest, then drove the knife straight through her broken left hand that was coming up to protect her face. She howled in pain, and he pushed her away from himself. She fell to her knees, grasping at the blade, now impaling her palm. Essa, if you ever, ever... Mess with me or my crew again, I will kill you. The captain punctuated his statement by raising his right leg and delivering a hard kick to the side of her head with the heel of his boot. It spun her across the floor and into the corner of a nearby bulkhead. She was already out cold when her body impacted it with a thud. Chapter 12 "'What in the space-blasted hell is taking so long, Herschel?' Faust screamed over the telewave. "'Do you have any idea what kind of mess there is down here? "'I don't even know if this thing's going to work.' "'Well, you've got about two minutes to find out. "'The energy signatures are getting pretty close to the airlock.' "'As Herschel and the other men worked frantically, "'he could only think about how irritated the captain would be that they had been so callous in ripping apart his ship. They'd had to knock through a bulkhead, and with only minutes to work, explosives had been the only option. 
There was also no time to go through proper procedure and deactivate the power conduit. He was seconds away from grabbing hold of a live wire, with enough juice running through it to turn a star whale into a charcoal briquette. Sir, we've got the connection severed, one of the auxiliary crewmen yelled out. Ooh, here goes nothing. You deal with Von Braun? Ansel asked. Let's hope so. What's the situation? Jones, having been so rudely interrupted previously by S's KA7Z, now explained. You see these? He pointed to some kind of machinery and conduits that ran up the length of the wall. They were now at the airlock, and the ceiling went from a mere ten feet or so to about thirty to accommodate large incoming cargo. The equipment he was pointing to was recessed into the wall and located behind glass panels, perhaps for easy access in case repairs were needed. I think these are the power regulators. Of course, I could be wrong. I think so too, Captain. At least that's what they look like, Ansel chimed in. Your point? That environment field, sir. That's got to take a lot of power to run. They probably have to dump massive amounts of energy from the main core into those towers to get them to work. I'm thinking these are regulators to keep them from overloading. That's nice, the captain said as he rubbed his sore sternum. I'm still not following you, though. Well, Ansel stepped in. Crewman Jones here seems to think that if we blow one of these, that a surge of power might overload their controls and permanently activate the whole system. Uh Uh-huh. And what do you think, Ansel? If it works, sir, I'll eat my socks. But what the hell else choice do we have? I see your point. He then turned to Jones. Didn't you say you could rig one of these pistols to explode, crewman? Herschel, we're not picking up any fire aboard the station anymore. That either means that they're dead or they're waiting at the airlock. It's now or never. You heard the lady? Dr. Ramos declared. He was standing by in case Herschel got zapped. But he knew better than anyone there that if the worst happened, there'd be nothing he could do except go fetch a broom and dustpan. Herschel took a deep breath and reached out with thickly gloved hands for the now severed power cable. He released a tiny sigh of relief when he touched it and didn't instantly burst into flames. It took two hands, however, to pry it free of where it was attached to the bulkhead, and one false move could spell disaster. He took a deep breath and pulled with everything that he had. If he wasn't bald, he would have thought the hair on his head would have visibly stood up for all to see. All around him, he heard a sigh of relief as the conduit broke free of the wall without incident. He stood there for a moment, in silence, surprised that he was still alive. Mr. Herschel, we're all delighted that you didn't get electrocuted, but time is of the essence, the doctor reminded him. Sam cautiously but with undue delay, moved the cable from where it was originally located to where the tap device was mounted a few feet away. It made a little spark as he lined it up with the connector on the ovoid-shaped tap, and everyone jumped, but he hesitated no longer and simply pushed the cable into place. Several green and yellow status lights began to come to life on the antiquated device, which was still covered in a heavy layer of dust. Herschel waited for the light labelled Ready to stop blinking and to illuminate a solid green. Quickly, he ripped off his heavy gloves and tapped the telewave on his belt. Faust, it's Herschel. You should have targeting control of the tap. The telewave was silent for a moment, then Faust came back. Got it. Locked onto the tower. 
Let her rip. No one was certain as to whether or not the machine would even work at all, let alone if it would power up the environment field. Herschel grabbed the large metal switch on the back of the tap and slowly raised it to the on position. That should do it, sir. Jones had taken three of the stunner's power cells to compensate for the fact that most of them were fairly exhausted. Great. What about that glass? If that alumiclear, we're never going to... The captain's statement was cut off by the sound of shattering glass. Guess it's just regular glass, sir, said Ansel with a grin. He'd used the butt of one of the pistols to smash a nice large hole into one of the panels. Jones fiddled with his improvised bomb just a bit more before walking over and tossing it into the opening that Ansel had created. Here goes nothing! He took off running in the opposite direction, and neither the captain nor the first officer questioned him. They simply followed suit. About twenty yards down the hallway, he squatted and covered his ears. Again, the two more seas and spaces did likewise. A massive surge of energy from the Honshu's fusion core surged through the tap and pummeled the station's tower, with more power than it was able to deal with. Woohoo! You did it! That tower's lighting up like a nova! Emily Faust yelled into her microphone, this time speaking to the entire ship, instead of just Herschel. Her solo celebration, high up in the cockpit, was short-lived, though as she felt the ship unexpectedly rock beneath her. Nothing overly violent, but something had definitely happened. What the hell? She spoke to herself as her fingers began to fly over her controls. The ship's scanners had picked up a large sudden release of energy, right in the vicinity of the airlock, and then it was gone. An explosion? Despite having covered them, all three men still found their ears ringing a little. The blast had been quite spectacular, and had knocked the lot of them from their crouching position to their knees. When they turned back and saw the dust settle, however, the large light over the inner door was glowing green, just like it had when they'd first come onto the station. I seriously cannot believe that actually worked, Ansel said, probably mostly to himself. Get to your feet, gentlemen. Let's get out of here. Captain Tarsic fumbled through the junk they'd collected from the guards and found the familiar device with the glowing crystal. As they approached the door, it began to glow with a faint white light, just as the captain had expected. It was a unikey, and bonded with whatever device was nearest at the moment. He pressed the little crystal, and sighed in relief, when it instantly turned blue and the sound of the door's inner workings coming to life began to fill the air. The men made their way through the inner and outer airlocks as quickly as they possibly could, which wasn't very quick, since the doors were painfully slow. Had they been in less of a hurry, they might have winced in terror as that outer airlock seal opened, about to discover if the environment field was actually active or if the green light had just malfunctioned due to the explosion. When it finally opened, they paused for just a moment to throw one of the stunners out in front of them to see if the automated sentry gun was still working. It apparently was not. With that, they ran out onto the platform at full sprint. A little more than halfway down the platform, Tarsic's telewave lit up. Pilot Faust to Captain Tarsic. Are you okay, Captain? Struggling for breath, the Captain replied. Get that loading bay door open, Pilot, and be ready to lift in sixty seconds. Aye, sir. Emily was a true professional, but having known her for some time, the Captain clearly picked up on some emotional relief on her part at the realisation that he and the others had made it out all right. The loading bay ramp had not even hit the deck when the captain, 
Ansel, and Crewman Jones jumped up onto it. Faust, close the door. Aye, sir. Gravity on the Honshu's loading bay deck pulled everything toward the stern of the ship. But all of the other decks had gravity that pulled everything toward the keel. From the loading bay floor, one had to climb a set of steps that curved up the rounded wall, and for anyone standing on the bottom, that person then appeared to be walking on the wall. It was a strange sensation, but it was fairly standard layout for most rockets. The only other part of the ship that had gravity that ran along the vessel's long axis, besides the loading bay floor, was the access tube that ran all the way from the bay up to the cockpit. It also provided access to the other decks. It was basically a tunnel with a ladder inside of it, and climbing the entire length of the ship was a hell of a workout, but in emergencies it could be necessary. Tarsic stepped into the tube and slapped his telewave. Faust, reverse the gravity in the tube. Sir? Do it. Faust grabbed the microphone from above her head and pressed the button. All crew, clear the access tube immediately, reversing gravity polarity in five seconds. She hung up the microphone in haste and tapped a few commands into her controls. Captain Tarsic, twelve decks below, had attempted to brace himself, but that was a very iffy proposition when gravity suddenly flip-flopped. He spun around in an instant and began to fall up, only slightly losing his grip and bashing his left elbow onto the side of the tube. He managed to regain his grip on the ladder and then placed his feet along the sides of it and let himself slide. When he finally reached the top, where the tube went into the cockpit, he skidded out and ended up coasting on his bottom halfway to Faust's chair. Not the most dignified entrance, but he'd had more embarrassing moments. Sir, I'm reading heat signatures from Prometheus. She's powering up. I'm assuming with orders to pursue us. That would be my assumption as well. He grabbed the overhead microphone and announced, All crew, we are blasting off immediately. Grab onto whatever you can. Then to Faust. You heard the order. Blast now. I want us at full burn as quickly as possible. Aye, sir. Primary engines firing in three, two, one. The ship shuddered as her engines pushed against the station's platform. Without a large gravity well like a planet, it took only seconds for the Honshu to be well clear of Aeolus. Captain! The Prometheus has a weapons lock on us. Swing us around the station. I want our guns right on her port side. You got that? Aye, sir. Emily manhandled the controls, just like she'd been taught. The Honshu had been upgraded with a very modern array of manoeuvring thrusters, and she handled much better than most ships of her size and mass. That sucker's got a full complement of atomic torpedoes. I don't think they'd use them on us. But if we stay close to the station, we guarantee that. Not to mention a Vulcan cannon. What? She's a rocket buster, Faust. Let's just stay at her flank and hope like hell they want us alive. In the view, through the front window, the station loomed large as Faust circled in close and came around under its docking platforms. Their rocket was indeed much more manoeuvrable than the hulking Prometheus. As they rounded one of the platforms, their target came into clear view. Tarsic's surprisingly agile fingers danced over the weapons controls located on the captain's console that was just behind Faust's chair. Locking on to one of her engine pods, we're going to cripple her. Powering up the Mark Nine. Captain? He expected her protest to be that firing the Mark Nine was likely to blow out a bunch of the ship's systems, but what she said instead floored him. We can't fire the Mark Nine. We had to divert power from it to get you off the station. What? he yelled, half in anger and half in utter confusion. Why had they had to bypass his big gun to get them off the station? That made no sense. They'd escaped all by themselves. Shit. 
locking on Mark II's. They both watched out of the window as their full complement of smaller proton cannons unloaded at the Prometheus with practically zero effect. They were closing too fast to load any of the torpedo tubes, let alone avoid the blast themselves when it went off. Besides, even conventional torpedoes could do a lot of damage, and Tarsic didn't want to take any lives unless it was absolutely necessary. It's not that he was a pacifist. In fact, he had a policy of killing those who tried to kill him. But he didn't want to be held on murder charges, since they were already involved in such a questionable situation. That's it, Faust. Take us to full burn. Give me everything, everything that you've got. Is that clear? Aye, sir, she complied, and lights all over the ship dimmed as she transferred every last joule of available energy to the neutron rockets. Just as they roared past the hulking enemy vessel, the vidwave circuit beeped. Put it on, pilot. This time, the screen was already warmed up and had been in use most of the day, so the image appeared pretty much instantly. The signal shifted momentarily and then came into tune. Captain Tarsic, this is Captain Deutron Cal of the IPHS Prometheus. You are ordered to stand down and surrender your vessel. Oh, come on, Captain. You know I won't do that. Tarsic, I don't have anything personal against you. The man's face seemed to indicate that he was telling the truth. He didn't seem very happy with what he had to do. But my orders are to take you down if you don't comply. Orders from whom? Von Braun? Yes, Station Commander Von Braun. Look, Captain, I wouldn't worry about her. Very soon she's going to be back in a prison cell where she belongs, for killing one of her own men with an unlicensed weapon. Deutron Cal's face went slack, and he turned to someone off-screen. He must have hit a mute button, because he had a quick conversation with whoever it was, and none of it was audible. Too bad Captain Tarsic had cheaped out, and not gotten the lip-reading feature for his vidwave. A moment later, the serious look returned to Cal's face, and he spoke again. I'm sorry, Captain, but as of this moment, my orders stand. Cut your engines and prepare to be boarded. We both know that's not going to happen. The captain attempted his special blend of sarcasm and charm. Then, I'm truly sorry, but you don't leave me any choice. And with that, the screen went blank. Captain Tarsic's expression immediately changed to one of concern. Faust? he asked, like a coy little boy about to be spanked. What are they doing? Again, Faust's hands rippled across her controls. I've got a large energy build-up on scanners. Captain, I think it's the Vulcan. Tarsic calculated his options in a nanosecond, and he really didn't like any of the alternatives. He slapped the telewave at his side. Ansel, where are you? Making my way up. Down. Whatever. To you, without breaking my neck. Why? What's going on? What level are you on? Just passing six. Get back down to five, ASAP. Why? Unlock the NC. Immediately, Ansel. Sir, I... Do it. That's an order. Copy that. Faust had been biting her tongue for a couple of seconds when the conversation ended. Sir, I think they're getting ready to fire. Patch the Prometheus energy readings through to my console. Aye, sir. As soon as the readings came up on his tiny little screen, he reacted. Faust, emergency blow of all starboard manoeuvring thrusters on my mark. Mark! The ship heaved violently as it lurched to the left. Less than a second later, a glowing reddish-orange ball of plasma tore past the ship and out into the abyss. 
They watched for just a few seconds as it seemed to fade, certain that they had just ever so narrowly missed their own demise. They're charging it again, Captain. Copy that, Faust. Ansel, where the hell are you? In the drive room, sir. I just need a second. I nearly cracked my head open just now when you manoeuvred. We don't have a second, Ansel. Now! Give me just a... The Martian entered his security code on the five-digit pad that was on the end of the rod that was stuck through the NC's vortex core. As quickly as he could, he grasped the rod and pulled it from the magnetically levitated ball. Got it! The ball, perfectly spherical, with a hollow centre and sixty-four holes in its surface, sprang to life and began to rotate and hum. Ansel had followed orders, as he always did, but he knew very well that they couldn't activate it, not inside the crux. Now what? We can't activate it. No choice, Ansel. Get out of the drive room, now. They're preparing to fire, sir. Oh, I am so going to regret this. Engage NC drive. Faust was in no mood to argue. She knew every bit as well as he did that they were likely to either vaporise themselves or be flung off into some far corner of the universe. But that Vulcan cannon staring up their backside was about to do them in regardless. Engaging. From the command centre of the Prometheus, Deutron Cal watched as the Vulcan's plasma ring shot forth, felt the slight shudder of the deck beneath him from the energy of firing the deadly weapon. Their second shot would not miss. Then, a flash of light, and the Honshu disappeared completely. It took several moments for him to realise that his mouth was agape. Chapter 13 Lips? Still here. Eyes? Still here. Still breathing. Emily Faust sat for a moment, collecting herself. By some miracle, they were still alive. She turned to see where the captain was, and found him sitting on the floor, nursing what looked like a pretty bad gash on his head. Where are we, Faust? Sir? It was as if her language centres hadn't yet realigned. It took her a moment to realise what he was asking, and then she instantly sprang back into her professional persona. Right. Checking stellar alignment, sir. Outside the window, there were definitely stars, and plenty of them. So at least it didn't look like they'd been flung off into the void. Tarsic's head was pounding, and when she finally came back with an answer, she sounded distant and somewhat muffled. We're definitely inside of a galaxy, sir, but I'm not getting a fix on our position. None of the stellar positions match those in the ship's data tapes. Well, that's just great. Then again, I guess it could be worse. A frantic beeping from Herschel's currently unmanned console got Faust to stand up on wobbly legs and walk over to it. She looked at it for a moment, trying to make sense of all of the information. It is worse, sir. The fusion core blew itself out and we're on battery power, which, for some reason, is at only 28%, so we can't restart it. Worst of all, it looks like we're inside a large gravity well and losing altitude fast. What? Tarsic sat up with a start, but it was only a moment before both of them saw exactly what they were falling toward. It loomed incredibly large in the front window, a planet that under other circumstances they would have been delighted to see. Beautiful blues and greens, vast seas, and magnificent land masses covered its surface. Its lovely feathered atmosphere no doubt was filled with breathable air. Snapping back to pure instinct, Faust jumped into her pilot seat and grabbed the controls. With only 28% power, this is going to be really tricky, sir. We do tricky all of the time, Faust. Just get us down in one piece, and we'll figure out the rest later. That's the plan, sir. 
she declared, as she corrected the ship's entry vector, and it took a dip toward the planet. Our entry speed is all wrong. Firing rockets in three, two, one. Six second burn to correct. The captain grabbed the mic and spoke into it. All hands, we're going in for a rough landing. If it isn't already understood by this point, grab onto something sturdy and clench those buttholes, kolakas, or whatever it is you came equipped with. Captain out. Far too much time hanging out with Ansel, Emily Faust thought to herself. The Martian had the ability to remain comical even in the face of immediate death, and it had long since rubbed off on Captain Tarsic. She thought about how close the two of them were. They were best friends, not just shipmates. Then her mind jumped to the horrible realisation that all of their friendships might be about to come to an abrupt end. Like the trained professional she was, however, she forced herself back into the moment. That's my girl, Emily. Good job. Good job. Tarsic tried to reassure her. She gripped the controls so tightly that her arms ached as she performed the delicate entry manoeuvre. He'd never admitted in front of general company, but he was incredibly proud of her of all of his people. They were his family. When the shuddering of entry finally ceased, of course, one's reaction was to feel relief, but both individuals in the cockpit knew that relief was far from the proper emotion for the moment. Atmospheric entry may have been tricky, but actually getting the honshu down in less than a million pieces was going to be the real miracle. Flipping her around, sir, the pilot declared, so that he would hold on to something. Using manoeuvring thrusters, she deftly turned the ship about, so that the rockets were pointing down, toward the ground, instead of up into space. Power level at 26%, going to full burn. This is going to be close. The mighty neutron engines of the RS Honshu lit up with everything they had to give. They were still falling at over 3,000 kilometres per hour, and the ground was getting close, very fast. 20 kilometres to surface, speed at 25,000 kilometres per hour. You can stop calling it out, Faust. Just do it. I trust you. Still coming in too fast, Emily fired up the manoeuvring thrusters and pointed them as far down as they would go, and began to use them to introduce a little lateral movement into their descent. This added a few more kilometres to their fall, but she'd have to have it completely under control before touchdown, or the ship would end up on its side. The Honshu trembled under the immense power of her engines, pushing against the alien atmosphere. Captain Tarsic watched as the altimeter clicked away. Four kilometres to surface? Three? Two? Emily, we've got too much lateral. She didn't have time to respond. The ship slammed into the dense forest canopy at nearly 200 kilometers per hour. A huge cloud of dust rose into the air, and the sky filled with bird-like animals, suddenly taking wing as they'd been spooked out of their treetop nests. Chapter 14 When the captain came to, and his eyes finally found focus. He saw something out of the cockpit windows that he'd never seen before. Trees. Sure they'd landed on plenty of remote planets, and seen trees in the distance, or they'd looked down and seen scorched trees where the honshu had landed, but never had he seen branches and leaves directly outside the window, pressing up against the transparent titanium to be precise. Light filtered in through those branches, and it was the only thing that illuminated the cockpit. All of the lights were off. The ship automatically cut cockpit lighting whenever natural surface lighting was detected, but he couldn't help but wonder if it was something else. Were the batteries completely dead? The hum of the ventilation system wasn't there, and that was not a good sign. Even when set down on a world with breathable air, the fans should at least be active, drawing in fresh air from outside. 
Faust, you still with me? Despite how weak he felt, the word sounded loud in the deathly quiet cockpit. He heard something stirring from the direction of the pilot's chair, but couldn't see Emily. Faust? Captain? What happened? You crashed my ship is what happened. Faust responded with a laugh that quickly turned into a cough. You okay up there, Faust? I don't think anything is broken, sir. I'll be okay when I catch my head. Any idea on our status? He could hear slim fingers tap away at her controls, but just as he'd expected, they were non-functional. Everything is dead, sir. The pilot tried to stand up, but instantly slid back into her seat and hit it with a thud hard enough to cause a large puff of dust to rise up from it, clearly visible in the rays of light coming through the treetops. A moment later, the captain heard her grunt loudly. She'd managed to jump from her seat to some of the controls near the front of the cockpit and grab on. The ship was sitting at a roughly 30 degree angle and artificial gravity was offline, so trying to get a look out of the window was easier said than done. Just looks like forest, sir, as far as I can see. The captain, still pinned against the wall at the back of the cockpit, grunted his displeasure. What about you? Everything still in place? I definitely feel like I've had a rough few days, but I'll live. He tried to get himself righted, but slipped and banged into the floor. We'd better go find Ansel, and see where we stand as far as the ship is concerned. Pilot Faust agreed, and after an extremely awkward few minutes spent trying to orient themselves, the two officers were finally able to make it to the access tube, which, of course, provided its own rather unique set of challenges, with the ship being at such an odd angle. It took some doing, but eventually they were able to scramble down the tube and found Ansel on deck five, just outside of the drive room. What the hell were you thinking? The Martian asked his captain, rather frankly, as he and Faust knelt down to check on him. Ansel, it was either activate the NC inside of the crux and take our chances, or get incinerated by the Prometheus' Vulcan cannon. Ansel shook his head. I see your point. Well, I take it by the enormous impact, and the fact that we're laying on our side, that we didn't get shot out into the void. No, we're somewhere with stars. I took a reading before we crashed, but the ship's data tapes couldn't get a fix on our position, the pilot said. For all we know, we could have been shot so far that we're an Andromeda, to be honest with you. We really don't know, Captain Tarsic admitted. Well, at least we're not in the void, Ansel said. Why did we crash, though? Faust immediately jumped to her own defence. When we came out of NC space, we were deep in the gravity well of whatever planet this is, and our vector was all wrong for escape. I could have tried to break orbit, but we might not have had enough power. Either that, or we would have escaped, but then been adrift with next to no battery reserve to keep us alive. Core flamed out? Yup. And we were at 28% battery power when we came out of NC. That's really strange, the Martian commented. Even if the core flamed out, we still should have been at full battery reserve. I can't explain it either, Ansel. Pilot Faust confessed. Regardless, Tarsic started, the situation is that now we're crashed on a planet in some unknown region of space, with no, or virtually no, battery power remaining. We have no way to restart the core, and even if we did, we're laying at such a strange angle, I'm not sure we'd even be able to lift. That's assuming the engines are even still there. The captain would never be pessimistic in front of auxiliary crewmen, but these two were his closest friends, and to be fair, he was in a truly crummy mood. He looked over at Faust. 
I told you that we had too much lateral coming down. Why didn't you listen to me? If it hadn't been for that lateral movement, we would have impacted at five times the speed we did, and none of us would be alive to be discussing this, Captain. Both of them immediately caught themselves and broke off the argument. It wasn't going to help their situation any if they started bickering. Let's get down to the loading bay and break seal. See what's out there. If we're incredibly lucky, there will be some kind of technological civilization on this planet. Regardless, we need to know where we are and what resources we have at our disposal. After that, we get everyone to work on repairs. We'll sort the power issue out when that time comes. The emergency lights are still working. Faust pointed to the glowing orange sconces on the wall. So we must still have at least some power. Emergency lights run off of their own battery backups, Ansel stated. Oh, said Emily, disappointedly. Just then, junior pilot Herschel and the doctor came around the corner. Perhaps fell around the corner was a better description. The captain reached out and grabbed both of them, preventing them from slipping further down the corridor. Thanks, Captain. That could have been very unpleasant, the doctor remarked. What happened? We had to hit NC inside the crux. We got thrown somewhere, and now we've crashed. The crashing part we'd already deduced, Captain. The doctor meant no disrespect by his tone. He simply spoke his mind. Exactly how one crashes in the middle of the crux was what had Herschel and I confused. Any idea where we are? We don't know. Some unknown planet in some sector of space we can't identify. Glad to see you're not charcoal, Herschel. Faust smiled at the junior pilot. Why would he be charcoal? The captain asked Faust, with a questioning look. Oh... Remember me saying that we'd rerouted power from the Mark IX? Yes, I do remember that. And that's why we ended up having to activate the NC inside of the Crux. And why we're now sideways on an alien planet. His directedness clearly indicated that he wanted answers. Trying to redirect the captain's anger away from the pilot, Herschel spoke up. We diverted power to the old tap device and used it to overload the tower and generate the environment field, so you could escape. Captain Tarsic ruffled his brow in confusion. No. Crewman Jones blew out the relays, and that's what activated the tower. Negative, sir. Faust spoke again. The tower lit up before we detected any explosion. Tarsic thought about it for a moment. Well... In that case, I suppose Ansel, Jones, and I owe you our lives. Commendations are in order, should we ever get off this rock. I expect you'll get my big gun back online ASAP, though? Oh, absolutely, sir, Herschel said, as he came to attention as best he could on the slanted floor. The sentry gun, Ansel interjected. Jones's bomb must have deactivated the sentry gun. That was lucky. The captain patted his old friend on the shoulder. Of that, I have no doubt. Let's see if luck holds out a little longer, though. Let's break seal, and see if there's any help out there. Faust and the captain helped Ansel to his feet, and the five colleagues made their way to the now treacherous access tube. As they descended through the bowels of the ship, the occasional crewman would pop his head in and ask what was going on. Each time they simply instructed the crewmen to follow them down to the loading bay. Upon arriving, they found crewman Jones already suited up and waiting for them. A couple of other crewmen from the lower levels of the ship had also joined him and were digging through lockers prepping to break seal as well. The first thing the captain went for was the trusty spiral ray pistol that he felt so incomplete without while aboard Aeolus Station. Actually getting to the equipment lockers was quite a challenge in the ship's current situation. But, being accustomed to adversity, they all managed eventually. In total, 15 souls stood by as Jones took the initiative 
and hit the switch that opened one of the loading ramps. The large door opened slowly, and several small trees underneath could be heard snapping as the force of its hydraulics smashed them into the ground with many tons of force. Everything looked just as it had from the cockpit. Lots of green vegetation. Very dense. Because of the way the ship was perched, the door could only open a fraction of its normal range. Still, it was enough for everyone to walk through, if they bent a little to clear their heads. The ramp was at a strange tilt that made it difficult to descend, so they had to help each other down. Faust had carried a scanner with her. She held the boxy device in her right hand, and waved it around as she fiddled with some of its settings. Good news is that there is nothing toxic in the atmosphere, and the life forms within scanning range all seem to be biocompatible, so there's air and food here. Bad news, Faust. Give me the bad news, Tarsic said, as his eyes scanned the forest. There could be any number of dangerous creatures, intelligent or otherwise, watching them from behind any one of those trees. Emily's face scrunched into a concerned little frown. The bad news is that I'm not picking up anything in the atmosphere that would signify industrialization. No large electromagnetic signals either. I don't think there's anybody here that could help us, Captain. Of course, given the choice between a pristine world fully capable of supporting life and being marooned in the void to slowly starve and suffocate, this planet was the ideal choice. But Tarsic was a spacer. He had no interest in a planet-bound life. And he was certain that most of his crew didn't either. While it was a relief to know that at least basic survival was possible for the time being, he tried to put the thought of being stuck here forever out of his mind. Ansel, you take Riley and Stankov. Inspect the outside of the ship to see what kind of damage we've sustained. Barely had he finished his sentence when a rumbling became audible through the brush, some place off in the distance. The hair on all of their necks began to stand up, and the sound closed in on them fast. Bird-like creatures, who had only just returned to their nests, took wing once again from the tops of the trees around them, and the captain reached for his sidearm. Everyone froze, most with their weapons at the ready. The intensity of the rustling plant life seemed to diminish as it got closer, and then, when they were certain that whatever was making the racket was within twenty metres of them, it suddenly stopped. They all looked at each other questioningly, but a low and deep growl instantly turned their attention back to the forest. Without warning, a figure stepped from the brush. Standing there, large as life before them, was none other than a Tyrannosaurus Rex. The captain locked eyes with the beast. Oh, you have got to be shitting me! Continued in part two, Where the Stars Fall. <laughs>